live tonight from the biggest, baddest, and fastest track on the NASCAR circuit. We say good evening, sim racing fans, and welcome. This is Talladega, and this is Saturday Night Thunder. NASCAR's best from the Xfinity Series, Truck Series, and more are back again. And we're happy that you're strapped into the seat along for the ride with us on the iRacing Esports Network, streaming live at eDascar.com. My name is Evan Pasoko, and alongside with Tim Terry and Justin Prince, we'll be in the virtual booth along for the call with you this evening. And Tim, a very, very different look to this third installment of Saturday Night Thunder compared to the last two that we've seen in Bristol and then Richmond. Two short tracks that we've seen, and now we go to Talladega Super Speedway. This one is going to be big, no pun intended. We're going to have a couple of heat races, and then we're going to have a 57-lap main event. So the format is still the same. We're still going to see some qualifying. We're still going to drop some drivers after heat racing, but then we're going to go racing and put on a show Super Speedway style. I can't wait to see how this one plays out. And the big story, obviously, is Talladega, Justin. We'll see it in use tomorrow afternoon for the EDAS Car I Racing to Pro Invitational Series, a thriller on deck for a 1 o'clock Eastern Time start, Fox FS1 and the Fox Sports app. But for now, as I mentioned, it's the Xfinity Series drivers on down. And, you know, this 2.66 mile super speedway located in Lincoln, Alabama is always a thrill, whether we're racing in the real world or on the sim. But it's also been Talladega week all week long on iRacing for members competing in the officially sanctioned series. And I'll tell you what, the draft package with these cars means that tonight is going to be wide open and tons of fun. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a tricky track to try and master because you never know what's going to happen in every single turn and even in every single straightaway because with the nature of super speedway racing, it's not just as simple as putting your foot down to the floor in terms of the gas and trying to go as quick as you can. You have to be tactical, you have to be smart, and you have to have a little bit of luck to get yourself in victory lane at this place. And Tim, you mentioned some heat racing due up. We are going to have to create the field of 40 drivers that make the main event that it will start next with single car qualifying. Two laps each, best lap puts down your time, and we will split the field into two heat races. They will each be 10 laps in length, top 20 from each going to make the show as we race to get 40 in that 57 lap main event, which does mean but 10 or so drivers not going to be competing in that main event. Yeah, I believe there's 48 drivers currently in the session right now. So, Evan, you can do the math. There will be eight drivers or four per heat race at this point uh, with only a couple of moments left in the practice session that miss the show. 40 make it on. And there's one reset there, as we mentioned as well. So that could be very key, especially when we come to that main event a little bit later on and see how those drivers kind of strategize and use that. But uh, these Drivers on the racetrack just wrapping up their practice session right now and getting ready to go qualifying and see where they start in those heat races. At the very best time at a practice right now in the hands of Ryan of Vargas. But let's talk, Justin, about what we think it's going to take tonight to get the done. And as we look at our Talladega keys to the race. And I'll start up front with you got a sprint before you could race. And that is with these heat races, 10 laps is not a lot of time. Yes, the threshold of the top 20 is relatively low. If the car count stays the same, only four drivers from each heat race will not advance through. But of course, your finishing position in those heats can dictate how nice you start towards the front in the main event. So kind of going aggressive early, but keeping that in line is what I think is going to be the biggest thing. Absolutely tonight, Evan, especially with the trickiness. The point I'd like to bring up, of course, is the big chungus or the big one, however you want to call it, because you never know what's going to happen in the racetrack. You never know when the big one can strike if you get multiple ones to strike. So that's where the importance of communicating with your spotter comes into play. Trying to make smart moves in the pack and trying to stay out of trouble throughout the entire race. And looking at that third point, guys, a Dega state of mind, you really need to think big picture here, especially when we get to that 57 lap main event. You have to be there at the end in order to win. You have to position yourself and get yourself to the edge. You can't win the race on lap number one, but you can sure lose it or put yourself behind the eight ball. So put yourself in a position to try to win this thing and think big picture, Dega State of Mind. 
And the qualifying session is now getting it underway. A single car qualifying. So all the cars are going to be on the racetrack at their individual times. And of course, this is a racetrack that I alluded to off of the top that is fun in the real world, just like it is on the service. And it is going to be a totally different show compared to the other Saturday Night Thunders that we've had. So we're happy that you're joining us this evening. And we encourage you to use the hashtag Saturday Night Thunder and join the conversation with us as this racetrack rolls on. But there's the shot from high and above, Justin. We talk logistics, the 2.66 mile super speedway with 33 degrees of banking down at one and two. That's the left hand side of your screen. A little bit less down in three and four, but oftentimes Talladega, and rightfully so, compared to Daytona as the only two plate tracks that the top NASCAR series run at. But the difference here, it's a little bit longer, yes, but as well, it is a wider racetrack. That leads to a possibility where more comfortable three wide, maybe even a four wide possibility. And of course, that start finish line, not where it typically is about halfway down the run to turn one, which has decided uh, the differences in many races over the years. Absolutely. You can see it right with this racing surface. You can easily make three to wide, in fact, up to four wide at Talladega if you have enough confidence in yourself and the drivers around you. In this type of a race, you never know what's going to happen, as we talked about. But with this type of race track, it can be tricky down that front straightaway, especially the bumps on the lower part of the groove. can be difficult to make sure you don't slide up off a of two or try and get tight into three as the tires start to wear a little bit in the super speedways. It's going to be fun tonight to see how drivers like Ryan Vargas... And the cars as well as a story are on board with the Vargas. And you can see that NASCAR Xfinity Series logo, of course, uh, has made a couple of starts uh, up at that level, Tim. And of course, coming from the Arkham and Art Series cars we saw at Talladega, we were in these Xfinity machines last week. And at that point, I questioned, did that give an advantage to the drivers who were regulars in these cars in the real world? But the tricky thing about Talladega is there's actually a couple of drivers through the field here tonight that have not competed at Talladega in real life. So could it be the opposite? Could it be the veterans who have the upper hand? Because it tends to be that younger group of drivers who actually have more of the in-sim time. You know, I think you hit the nail on the head when we came in here tonight, Evan. You mentioned Talladega is on the official series all week long, the B car, the A car, the uh, Class C, uh, the truck as well. So if a driver has been on there trying to get some laps in, I think we're going to see uh, those drivers maybe plan their strategy a little bit better. There's Angela Ruck on your screen and the double zero coming by to complete one of her qualifying laps here this evening. Only a minute 45 left, so these drivers trying to get their time on the board as Ruck completes her lap, lap number one at a 53.97, so uh, and lap two at a 53.88, so she picks up on lap number two. But yeah, I, I think if you put some time in this week, maybe you did some official racing, maybe you have a little better feel for the race car. It's all about seat time at the end of the day. It doesn't matter if it's a real or a virtual race car, right? Yeah, the big thing here is actually the time with other cars on track, Justin, because you can go out there and anybody can hot lap around the bottom at Talladega Super Speedway, but it is going to be those drivers with that bit of finesse here and qualifying that could advantage. Obviously, with two laps, you're probably going to take your first lap up against the wall to wind it up, then go to the bottom for your actual flyer on two. So we'll expect most of these drivers for their second lap to be their best. But, you know, the practice races that has been available, and even in the practice session in the last hour, Hour, drivers haven't really wanted to go out in a pack of two or three. They've all kind of done little pit parties. They all wait at the end of the pit lane to wait to get a, good, a big group together, and then they go off. It's that experience that's going to rain paramount, whereas at a place like Richmond, that single car speed was much more important. Yeah, indeed, and that's the thought process for some drivers is you might not have the best qualifying times in some cases, but if you can get yourself good track position as the race progresses and keep yourself out of trouble – you can potentially get yourself into victory lane tonight. You just need to be smart about it. Lots of these drivers, though, want to get valuable positions for the heat, though. And a familiar date up front as it is Josh Berry, your race winner from last weekend at the virtual Richmond Raceway, who is the best in qualifying, just to edge it out uh, at the top there, the likes of Stenzel and other drivers. So that's a look at your qualifying results uh, here for the single car runs uh, from Talladega. But now we're going to split the field in half, 24 cars to each heat race. 
bottom four are eliminated and the top 20 drivers get to make it to our 150 lap main event so let's take a look at your starting grid for heat race number one and courtesy of pole position in queue josh berry gets p1 for heat one he'll join the front row alongside bailey curry who starts in second position and it is a dynamic i racing duo on row two with landon huffman and chase cabri third and fourth they'll be joined by kyle weatherman in p5 tim and Anthony Alfredo rounds out the top six. You got Christian Eckes and Justin Allgaier in your next row. Noah Gregson, Josh Balicki, Drew Herring. And good to see Gus Dean with us. He knows his way around Talladega Super Speedway. He'll start 12. 13th position sees Harrison Bird in a law on with Jeffrey Earnhardt in the qualifying order. Tommy Joe Martins, Blake Cook, Jesse Awuchi, and Brandon Brown round out the first nine rows. Run number 10 is going to see Jeb Burton and Tyler Anker round out the top 20. So the 26 car in as of starting spot. So CJ McLaughlin is all with Thad Moffitt, Donnie Leah, and Josh Williams will be the drivers who have to make up some positions as they round through those top 24 spots. We got a hungry field full of Chevy Camaros, Ford Mustangs, and Toyota Supras ready to go. These drivers spanning the NASCAR ranks from down through the regional series, uh, NASCAR overseas, the Euro series, as well as the Canadian series, the Mexican series, not only that, but of course, uh, with the Gander RV Outdoors Truck Series, you also have your Xfinity and Arkham and Arn series drivers. But 24 cars get into roll, one pace lap. The light is already out on top of the iRacing pace truck. And the biggest thing, Tim, is I did say you got to sprint before you could race. You have to survive. That remains true, uh, but you have to find the balance between aggression and be uh, conservative because we assume uh, that we're not going to get through these 10 lap heat races without an incident. Uh, there's always a chance it could happen, but uh, to put my Larry Mack hat on, the trends would suggest that that's not likely. You know, you look at the short track mentality per se, when you look at heat races and con season and, and all that stuff, if you're in a transfer position, sometimes that sense of urgency is not necessarily there, especially if you're at the front as you look at the weather conditions, beautiful 76 degree weather this evening, eight mile an hour wind and a hot track at 117 degrees. If you're Josh Berry, if you're Bailey Curry, these drivers up in front, you might not see a whole lot of sense of urgency. Yes, it is a starting position in the main event, but you're locked in. You do not want to put yourself in a position that you end up wadded up and you're outside of the top 20 and you don't make the big show. So we might not see that sense of urgency necessarily up in the top you know, 10 or so, but you might start seeing it in the second half of the pack where these guys and gals know that they have to race and they have a little bit of pressure on them to get into the show. And we've talked about allegiances and teammates, Justin, through these last couple of weeks. But at Talladega, it is so, so important. I've done a lot of the official stuff at iRacing this week. Got pushed to a race win uh, by Jason Willowen last night. You, everybody needs that kind of buddy to stick with them. Are we going to see the real-life teammates group up? I noticed that a lot in practice. I think so. It's going to be vital to have people who want to be friends with you and have teammates who are willing to work with you, expect potential working together, so to speak. A lot of communication amongst those drivers to make sure they're all on the same page and what they want to do strategy-wise. You got to keep in mind, though, too, it's not as simple as shove the person in front of you and shove them all the way to the front. You can tandem with these cars, but the temperatures can spike in just a half a lap of pushing, so you have to be careful with it as a team and as a driver. And we'll see if they're going to be more aggressive in the 10 lap heats than they will be in the 57 lap feature a little bit later on. Also, one quick repair available to all the drivers in the field, but it is going to be in the hands of the 88 of Josh Berry. Green flag flies. We're racing for heat race one at Talladega. It's big track racing, short track style, first time to turn one. They'll dive it into corner number one this time. Keep an eye on that outside line and see what can happen there we get three cars on that outside line about middle of the pack right here you see justin allgaier with a little bit of help in behind from drew herring as they work at a corner number two josh berry on that inside line still seems to be the way three wide down the back and here comes cabri through the middle well they're using that extra space that we talked about but i don't think it's how the 74 bailey curry wanted it to work because cabri got down on the inside and there is no help up top for the 74 of curry so he's gonna duck in line now for the buddy outside as a duo of anthony alfredo and the nine of noah gregson c van c to get going but for the moment they stay loyal to the back of the forward of cabri and it'll be a drag race to the line to see who leads lap number one and the inside tends to be better early oh there's already contact 
attacked. Barry is going to get turned by Cabry. And it is a big mess down into turn one. Josh Barry up and over in these hate races, though. No yellow flags, so it carries on. And your new race leader, Anthony Alfredo. And that's going to be vitally important to make sure you can try and get going to try and use the one faster pair you have for the last chance qualifiers, because that might be the difference between making the show or watching on your couch in just a few minutes. Just take a look at how much this pack has broken up because of that incident. Just the top three have broken away from everybody else. Eventually, that pack is going to grow back in size, though, with the arrow five cars in the backdrop. And it was really an incident that developed out of nothing. And that quick repair that I mentioned, Tim, now going to be a big factor because if you were in that incident, get to the pit lane, get it fixed. Again, only four drivers not going to make it. Certainly more than four cars involved in that incident. Let's take a look at this incident. And, of course, right off at the top, you'll see the inside. Barry gets involved. But watch the 75 car, second in line, right there. Just a bit of a push-up by Landon Huffman. He gets into Cabrini and hooks him down into Josh Barry. And when they went up, it was a quite a wild ride for the 88 machine. So there's about 12 cars or so involved in that, Evan. So we got two races right now. As Anthony Alfredo gets stuck in the middle, we're going to go three wide for the lead. Put that 54 of Weatherman to the inside and the nine of Noah Gregson, even with that little bit of damage to the outside. There's two races going on right now, Evan. There's this race up in front to win this heat race and pick up the checkered flag. There's also a race to pit road to potentially use your reset to try to not be in that bottom four. So we get two races to keep our eyes on within one race as we complete lap number three. And Kyle Weatherman is your new leader. And the battle for the race lead is the excited one because we're three wide at the moment. Alfredo, only driver in the middle. Uh, and that dude wipe Chevy, he'll tuck down in line. And Noah Greg's it up top of the nine, lucky to survive. That looks like he's trying to get hooked up with Jeter Motorsports counterpart and Justin Allgaier. But there is a lot of rear end damage to the nine of Gregson from contact. So it is going to make it more difficult for the car behind to push and to properly drop with him. You're on the board with that. Alfredo, he's fourth in line of this breakaway. It sees Wenderman, Eckes, and Curry run one, two, three on the racetrack. And in theory, Justin, as long as they stay smart about this, they could probably race for that heat race win on the white flag. But I don't see any reason that this group of four splits apart right now. Absolutely agree with you. Just play the conservative car. You're already in the show. Just stay in line if you want to get the heat race victory. Try and get something to go with that point. But I wouldn't be surprised to see these drivers just run around the O-line, try and go the shortest way around and go from there, especially since you mentioned the damage to Noah Gregson in the second pack. He's only going dead even in pace to Anthony Alfredo and the rest of the drivers in the top four, despite the fact that he's got the toe just barely off the back end of the 33. Yeah, the lead pack right now is those top four, but then you look back and there is the Gregson group. It is led by the nine. Allgaier, Drew Herring, Josh Balicki, Jesse Wuji are in that group. So it's a group of five. And you can say they're doing a good job as well, Tim, of staying single file. So pretty shortly here, as you can see, the lead pack now starting to close down on them. Uh, they were about a second behind last lap now to within six tenths. So this should shortly become a nine car lead pack. And we're just past the halfway point in this heat race. Five laps down and five laps to go in heat race number one. And just keep a half eye on that battle in behind. Currently, 18 drivers, Evan, are on the lead lap. We've got two that are a lap down, Cabri and Barry. And then the first one on the outside looking in would be Gus Dean. So keep that one in mind. Barry, no pressure from behind right now. This is the best battle on the racetrack. And there goes Alfredo to the outside. Breaks him with the run to the inside looking for position number four. Yeah, not sure if the 33 thought that Greg said it was going to carry that momentum up to the outside and work with him. He went up top, and of course, Anthony Alfredo, one of the more experienced sim racers in the field, uh, misses out on that exchange. He does find a spot in line, but the 9 and the 7 uh, both were able to get up around him. And we talked about the two different races in this race. Your top 18 cars are on the lead lap right now, which means that lapped cars Chase Cabri and Josh Bear when you have final transfers, Gus, Dean, Blake, Cook, first drivers out, but none of those bottom four drafting together. So it is going to be difficult for any of them to go from below to above that cut line. Yeah, they all came out in different places across the racetrack once they got their faster pairs in because of the nature of trying to get their engine back fired up. Some of them had engine problems, not be able to fire, refire the race cars, but 
Keep an eye here now on Noah Gregson. It took a little bit of time, but the closing rate started to kick in with having that draft on the back end of that first group. And he might have a little bit of an advantage since he's got a friend in Allgaier who might be willing to try work with him in these final two and a half or so laps. It's funny, we get this deep into a Talladega race, Tim, and this is typically where you start to settle down just a little bit. And we try to you know, get into a rhythm, but the next time by, it'll be the popsicle sinks in the air and just two laps to go in this heat race. So all these cars are good. I kind of was thinking out loud, talking to Justin a few laps back, that if they just kind of ride on the white flag, at least to get close enough to the line where if you wreck, you'll still slide across the start finish and you know you're going to be in the main event then you can fight for it, but I wonder if these guys will remain that patient or do they fight at all? The, you know, the competitor in me tells me that uh, these drivers obviously want to win. Heat Race feature doesn't matter, and maybe we're going a little bit earlier because the seven of all guy going to leave his teammate. He'll work with Anthony Alfredo to the top. Justin Allgaier are taking that look to the outside line. Noah Gregson thinking about it. Here he goes to the outside line and back to the inside. That might have been a little bit of a mistake by that nine going up and going back down. But now it's a single car line. And Evan, I agree with you. When you look at the competitor side of things, you get to lap number 10. You're going to finish tail end of the lead lap. Right now there's 17 drivers on the lead lap. So the competitor in me wants to win a race, but I also want to start up inside the top 10. If I finish in the top five in this race, I'm going to start in the top 10 in the main event and have track position. So I'm kind of torn. They're going to come to the white flag. We're going to figure out what they want to do here in this first heat race. And don't forget, Tim, as well, you still have Josh Berry that's chugging along right now trying to hold on to the final transfer spot as well during this final lap. He's still got about a 16-second advantage or so over Gustine. So that's going to be the battle for that 20th position, the final transfer spot into our 150-mile main event. But up front, it is the white flag. And a final time around for Heat Race 1. Up at the very front, it is Kyle Weatherman. He leads the field, followed by Chris Janakis and Bailey Curry. They have pulled away a little bit from the struggling duo of the 9 and the 7. I think the damage on Gregson is slowing down Allgaier. Final time now into turn number three. Does Zekis stay on the 17 or does he go to the outside? And if he does, who does Bailey Curry work with? Final time off of four now. Weatherman going to hold the inside and there will not be a challenge from behind. And Kyle Weatherman, late dive, not enough. Weatherman wins heat race one. Very clean heat race after the big wreck that we had on lap number one. And give it to Kyle Weatherman. He was solid up in front, held that lead, and is going to start on the provisional pole when we go racing for the main event 57 laps a little bit later on. So uh, Kyle Weatherman did a great job as you'll look at your iRacing results from heat race number one. Full race results, Weatherman gets the win. That'll give him the best starting spot possible for the main event later on. But all these drivers, Zach is Curry, Alfredo, Allgaier, through your top five. You can see where that lead pack ended with uh, Josh Balicki and Noah Gregson because of Wooji, Herring, and Martins. Those are the drivers, a significant portion behind. A lot of them got way onto the binders to avoid the wreck to not get involved. But that's the first page. Drivers who move on, Justin, everybody else through P20 also going to the main. Yeah, Josh Williams advancing, Brandon Brown, Harrison Burden, Donnie Leah in 14th, Landon Huffman, Tyra Ankrum, Jeff Burden on the lead lap, Chase Cabry in 18th. Josh Berry did catch up on the last lap to CJ McLaughlin, but everyone else on tap three, done for the night. Gustine, Blake Cook, Thad Moffat, Jeffrey Earnhardt. This driver is not going to be racing in the Saturday Night Thunder Bay event. Now let's go back trackside for heat race number two in the second spot in qualifying. So all the even numbers in that single car queue going to end up over here. It is Scott Stenzel on the pole position, joined by our Saturday Night Thunder winner from Bristol uh, with uh, Logan C.V. Ryan Ellis and Ryan Vargas going to double up to make row two. They'll start third and fourth position with Stephen Light to Kaz Grala through P6. You got Justin Haley in the next row with Will Rogers to the outside. Brett Moffat, Austin Sindrick, row number five through your top 10 starters. Michael Annette and Ruben Garcia Jr. in the 27. Todd Gillen in 13th position to start. Chase Briscoe starts alongside him in row number eight. Ryan Truex and Derek Krause. Alex Obey, who had a strong performance at Saturday Night Thunder at Bristol a couple weeks ago, 19 in the starting positions in 17th round in Matt Mills. 
We can see it on three. You can see the likes uh, of Dollar Ed Gibbs on a row 10. Joe Graf, Jeter, and Angelo Rock to be the next duo, along with Byatt Snyder and Spencer Boyd through position 24. Looked at the bottom at your heat race number two starting grid. So I think the biggest takeaway from heat race one and all of that, Justin, don't get in the big one. And the, the funny thing about Talladega is oftentimes that is a whole lot easier said than done. I tend to, you know, enjoy staying on the bottom of the racetrack, at least early in these plate races, because uh, you have more of an escape route down to the bottom. If you're up top, you're kind of pinched in with limited options. But at the end of the day, uh, you do need some luck no matter where you are on track if we see another big mess like we did that first time. Yeah, you can escape to the apron if there's enough space to try and avoid an incident if you do have that bottom line. There's also the thought process, though, if you're on that top line in the driver's say swing down the circuit, say on the back straightaway, you're in a better spot if that happens. But there's also the risk of if there's the big one in the corner, you get trapped, like you said, because cars might swing up the circuit before they come back down the banking. So it's just a matter of playing the lines the right way when it comes to that specific moment. And for some of these drivers, I expect them again, if they're up at the front, stay conservative, stay at the bottom line. If they need to get up towards the teams, let's say to be safe for a transfer spot, expect them to try and get that top line to work early. But of course, if you think the heat races are crazy with 24 cars, it is going to be 40 in the main event. That's about the same number that we're expecting for the Pro Invitational tomorrow, of course, with the, uh, the NASCAR Cup Series stars and more. But the pace truck is going to dive down it in. Scott Stenzel in control, another driver with a lot of fiery seat experience alongside the 67 of Logan CV. You just got to survive 10 laps and you can't finish in the bottom five. Four. That's the name of the game as we look to the flagman and they roll out of the trioval green flag in the air. Let's do it for heat race number two. Let's see who comes out of this one clean. It's Scott Stenzel to the inside. Logan CV working that outside line. And look at the 98 already. Is that Briscoe on the outside line already? Three wide. He's all by himself, but he's trying to make moves. He popped right up to the outside with a big run. Did not want to work with the 88 machine. It was a little bit slow off of the jump there, but it's not going to pay out, and that third line dies off almost immediately. He's going to be looking for a spot down in line at the time this back down into turn number three, and that's exactly what he'll do. So it is still Stenzel and CV leading the respective inside and outside lanes. Justin, and the thing that made that incident in heat race one so problematic was it happened literally at the very front of the field, so everybody behind had to get through it not the the drivers involved that i would have suspected uh, to make a mistake as such but so far so good in this one is that 98 machine briscoe committed to trying to get a third lane going we race leader lap number one is cv and part of that came down to the bumps once again we talked about a little bit that are in that trioval which can bounce you around as a competitor and make it difficult to hold on stability wise these drivers looking a bit more comfortable at least for the start there's still a long ways to, ways to go, though, with there being eight laps to go this time by, and a lot of drivers trying to catch up to that middle line you see in the backdrop. And you can see the 18 machine up at the very outside. So Ty Gibbs working with Briscoe. We mentioned that Talladega a lot wider than Daytona makes a three wide almost the norm as opposed to something that'll uh, kind of get the hairs at the back of your neck standing up. But I don't think they're going to have too much success with just two cars in that group. Again, you're fighting against what is basically five on the bottom, four in the middle. And then, of course, the rest of the field, you can see off of the back shot, still uh, pretty strung out too wide throughout. And I think Ty Gibbs is kind of signaling, hey, let's duck back in line. And they do so. So big pack race hit up at the front of the field. We'll see if these drivers are able to manage those temperatures, as Justin alluded to earlier. As you can see, Kaz Grala is pushing the 50 of Vargas down the back stretch. You can't do that for too long. Track tip 117 degrees as well means that in that main race a little bit later on, old tires can be a factor with some time. Higher spin, but up front, a pretty uh, stationary. Hard for these drivers to get through the traffic up front, and for those brave enough to try a third lane, not as many drivers willing to try to do it as well. And really, there's only been three. Briscoe and Gibbs have been the two on the top side trying to make it happen. Derek Krause was up there a couple laps ago, but couldn't get anybody to go with him. You ride on board with the Ford, the 98 to Chase Briscoe. Got that 18 in front of him now, and we'll see what happens. See if they can mount a run. This. 
heat race so far, Evan, has been clean. I'm so sure some of these drivers in this lead pack kind of on pins and needles, trying to see what's going to happen next, but it's pretty calm up here for two wide racing at Talladega. It is. We still have those drivers moving in and out, and a check up at the bottom is Ryan Ellis. Set it up on the apron, down into three. You're on board with the Briscoe, and he's ball riding up on the outside of the racetrack, which means that that battle for the transfer spot is in this lead pack. Michael Annette, however, had an issue off of the start of this race. The one car is out of it already. So there's only three drivers now really fighting uh, to make the main show because we know Annette's not going to do it. He's two laps down. Fortunate for Michael and Ed, absolutely. But for the rest of these cars, now the focus is make sure you are prepared for potential craziness. And we're already seeing this with a couple of the cars. There is a massive amount of suck up with these Xfinity cars in the middle of the corners. It can be so easy to just zone out, hit the gas a little too hard and hit the back bumper of somebody. And you never want a bump draft in the middle of the corners because it ends up causing the big one in that sort of way. So if you're these drivers, you have to be careful on what you do here. And let's talk about that transfer spot as the battle up front continues. Mid-pack is where all the craziness is. Todd Gilliland in the 38 car, the last time by, was scored in 20th. And that would be the lucky uh, spot and the, the final spot to make the main show. So Truex and other drivers, you can see, oh, and a spinner now across the start-finish line. It's Ruben Garcia from position 20. He got spin out of line after he got turned by the 15 car. And just like that, Garcia's night is done. Get a little contact with Drew Dollar. Going to send him out. They're going to go three wide again to the outside. There goes the leaf filter number 11 of Justin Haley. He's got help from Gibbs on his back bumper. And now Briscoe going to be in the middle instead of popping up high. So two drivers still back up high, Evan. But Chase Briscoe in the middle and trying to make some moves. Myatt Snyder on his back bumper. Will Rogers is there. And that third group not going anywhere. And we get a second look now at that incident involving Garcia, and you'll see the kind of little bit of a checkup. Watch the 15, just trying to follow him, but as he chased him up the hill and checked up, he hit him in that left rear quarter panel, and it turned the 27 around, and it was a hard hit to the inside. So just like that, uh, the night is over for Garcia. He'll join Annette, and now it is just uh, two drivers actively on track, still fighting for their lives at the rear of the field. But working lot number 7 of 10, the third lane has got a little bit more support is now Briscoe once more going to jump up in front of that 11 car of uh, Haley up on the outside and in fact now right back down to the inside Ty Gibbs once again a pusher on the very outside is that third lane going to get some numbers anytime soon it just looks like most drivers are content on staying in the bottom two lines for the time being here Evan yes that usually does develop as this race goes on that third line just no one wants to go up there and be that aggressive yet Keep an eye, though, on that battle for the final transfer spot because Drew Dollar's just trying to hang on to the middle line of the back end of that pack. And because of all the fighting and that squiggle, there's the chance for drivers to move in. And you can see on the board with Alex LeBay how claustrophobic it is in the middle of a three-wide battle at Talladega. The driver representing the NASCAR Pinty Series has uh, had a lot of success on iRacing the last couple of weeks. He's fourth in line in the middle and is almost now clear of that Haley and Gibbs duo up the outside. As the 11 car walking it down, walking it down, and the third lane is now extinct for the moment. So two wide through this lead pack that is 22 cars strong this time by two laps to go for the 55 of will rogers we mentioned big picture and it's kind of hard to say big picture in a sprint race evan but alex lebay was hanging around the top 20 oh little contact to the inside engine and engine gonna save it we had a blown motor yeah, that's Kaz Grala. He's smoking. We talked about the temp. See, that car popped from third and line on the bottom. So Kaz is going to drop back, and he now likely not going to make the feature because that thing blew up on him. You can see the smoke pouring out, Justin. That's going to be a big win for those two cars behind him who are basically dead in the water. And Matt Mills and Spencer Boyd, but the battle for the heat race win continues as we look for the white flag. Absolutely huge for that to happen at that amount of time because uh, that's where you have to keep an eye on the temps. If you allow them to get too hot, your engine can go any time. And now, white flag is out, and that makes the transfer spot very interesting. 
Oh, and there's no room for CV at all. Rogers gonna get turned. It's Rogers in front of the field. Now Gibbs involved. The Snyder as well. And the big one strikes on the white flag lap. Again, no caution. We stay green. And you look in front now as they're all chasing down. Chase Briscoe pushed by LeBay. Vargas all on his own. The third car in line. And it is gonna be a mad dash of destroyed race cars trying to limp it back to the end to make the show but this is the fight for the win in heat race number two LeBay trying to go high side can't get the nose up top Briscoe too good he'll slide up to block and it is Briscoe winner in heat race two the and driver who tried that outside line for numerous laps Evan is going to come home with the win and Here's Ty Gibbs trying to put that thing across and try to make it into the show. But, man, oh, man, he's not the only one in that situation, Justin. And Kaz Grawa, remember, had the ability to get a faster pair. If Kaz Grawa can get him his way up to Gibbs, he's still got a chance to try and move on. He's going to have to hope that he can go as quick as he can, 50 miles an hour quicker than this 18. In the 18th machine, this is the race to the line as he's currently 20th position on track. Can he make it through? Ty Gibbs crosses the line, position 20. You can see Grala there, less damage, but it took him longer to go. And he passes Gibbs now, but after the end of the heat race, so that's the difference between going to the main event or not. Well, let's recap what the results look like, because what a final lap in heat race number two. And you can see how far the spread was for the cars that survived it. And we knew it, that it was Chase Briscoe holding off Alex LeBay for the win, all the way down through Spencer Boyd, your top ten. Yeah, page number two, you're going to see these drivers in the main event as it begins to grid Justin Haley, Stephen Light, Logan Seavey. You look all the way down there, there's some drivers that really had to putt across the line, Justin, and there's four that, unfortunately, their hearts are broken. They're not in the show. Cascarola nearly did the impossible. Took a fast repair on the last lap for his blow motor, nearly because the big one made it into the show, still seven seconds back. Andrew Ruck, Ruben Garcia, Michael Annette also did not make it. So that's how the heat race is ended. We are on the grid. Let's do it. As we get set for 150 miles, let's take a look at your starting grid for tonight's Saturday Night Thunder 150. Feature race will be led by Kyle Weatherman. The heat race one winner going to be joined on the front row by the heat race two winner and Chase Briscoe. So heat race one transfers left. Heat race two on the right. You can see Ackes and LeBay end up third and fourth. With Bailey Curry and Ryan Vargas, your top six. Anthony Alfredo and Scott Stenson with the next row. Justin Allgaier, Will Rogers, and Noah Gregson had that little bit of damage in the heat race. We'll see what he can do from 11th. Matt Mills next. Joshua Bolecki starts in 13th. Drew Dollar in 14th spot. Jesse Aluchi will start alongside Austin Sindrick. Drew Harry making a Saturday Night Thunder debut in 17th with Derek Cross in 18th. Thank you, Tidbit, on down through. Tommy Joe Martins and Spencer Board going to be the halfway point in the field through P20. Josh Williams and Johnson Haley, the next duo, with Brandon Brown and Stephen Light, P23 and 4. Harrison Burton, Logan CB, row 13. Donnie Leah will start on the inside of row 14 with Brett Moffat to the outside. Landon Huffman and Ryan Truex have some work to do. Tower Ingram very deep in the field in 31st tonight. Joe Graff Jr. will start alongside him. Rosen, number 17, Jeff Burden, and Ryan Ellis. Chase Cabry starts 35th. Todd Gillen starts in P36. And at the very back, you'll find the final transfers. Josh Berry, Byatt, Snyder, CJ McLaughlin, and Ty Gibbs through 40th. Ty Gibbs, though, unable to make the starting grade. So the rules change, obviously, a little bit for this feature race, Tim Terry. We go to 57 laps, which means pit stops will be required at one point. There is still one fast repair available, up to three attempts, and agreed by Checkered. But the big thing that was obviously missing from those heats is there are cautions controlled by the live admins. Yeah, absolutely. If race operations deems that there's a, a need for a caution on the racetrack, they will throw it. So that's going to be a little bit of a difference. I think we're going to see a little more patience here. Evan, as you mentioned, there will be a pit stop. If they get to a green flag pit stop, that could be intense as well. Where do you come down pit road and when do you come down and who are your friends? We're about to find out as they come out of corner number four and we get ready for some Saturday Night Thunder. We're happy that you're part of the action here on the IRACD Sports Network. Reminds you to use the hashtag Saturday Night Thunder. Be in the conversation with us. 
as we get set to hand out a virtual checkered flag here from Dega. The pace car down at end, though. It'll be Kyle Weatherman on the front row. It's his field to control. As we say, let's go Saturday night. Thunder Racing from Talladega. We're underway. Nice clean start for both flights, it looks like. And Briscoe's already showing his hand. He wants to get away from the front of the pack. He wants to start in the back already, drifting all the way to the back of the line. And James Jett asked it on Twitter, is that the strategy to drop to the back? And clearly for Briscoe, yes, he does not want to be up in the battle for the lead here. Immediately hitting the eject button. There's more drivers doing so. Ekis using the apron on the back straightaway to drop back. And it has really hurt that outside line because Alex LeBay working. The Vivica Park is basically on their own. Well, the inside stays together. And Weatherman sitting pretty in the opening lap. Yeah, Derek Krause and Drew Herring among those that are going to the back of the field. And it comes back to that big picture, get to the end of the race. You can't win it on lap number one, get some laps in and run a little bit, except for these guys up here in front, Kyle Weatherman. And we saw it in the heat race, Evan. He was solid up in front. He's going to be tough to beat here this evening. Christian Eckes on his back bumper, Bailey Curry all on the inside. The outside line starts to form, but it forms in positions four and five as the 90 of Alex LeBay tries to bring it to the front. Yeah, the reinforcements come in the form of the 9 of Noah Gregson and the 55 of Will Rogers, but still outnumbered. But the car is on the bottom, and you can see in the back of the back even some more too wide with the Briscoe and others uh, who are not in the immediate fight up front. And listen, Justin, this is the same thing we see in real life, and it's the same strategy on the sim. Not wanting to risk, even with that one quick repair, to be up front in where it could get ugly early. Some drivers thinking, listen, this is a long race. 57 laps, 150 miles. We're going to drop back and hang out. The cars you ride on board with, including Vargas and the rest of the race leaders, though, we're going to go in here and have some fun and we're going to battle right from the get-go. I like to call it kind of a chess match, if you will, because you have to think, do I want to try and stay up towards the front and stay in front of potential incidents, or do I want to keep myself in the back, as we talked about, and try and make sure you keep away from the big one if it happens at the front of the field and be patient. A lot of the races that I've seen throughout the week for here at Talladega, Evan, the latter strategy has been the winning strategy. Yes, you want to try and lead left, but at the same time, you have to think about you're also burning a lot of extra fuel by being the lead car in these packs, for example. You can burn an extra gallon or so in terms of fuel in a whole run if you led an entire run as the lead pack car. And leading that time by was Alex LeBay on the outside. And there's always somebody who may be joining us for the first time on Saturday Night Thunder. Do we tend to get the questions as there's three wide in the back? Yes, this is the Alex LeBay and the Christian Eckes and all of these drivers, all the pros competing here on iRacing. And boy, I'm sure, Tim, these drivers would love to have that one reset in the real world. That is kind of the biggest thing that stands out strategy-wise to me is if you do make a mistake, there is that mulligan available. Absolutely there is. It's a matter of when you use that and right here obviously if there is a big wreck that's when you're going to want to use it but up front for the most part these drivers are uh, kind of taking it easy right now. You saw the 68 of Brandon Brown work the outside line, the extreme outside line. He's come back into the second groove but that second groove right now kind of disjointed compared to that inside line. The inside line tucked up tight together but maybe they're Maybe they're riding, maybe they're learning some things here as the 38 of Gilliland hops up to the outside, middle of the pack is a rumble at a corner number two. And it is the rumble of Saturday Night Thunder as the battle for the race lead continues on. And, and well, it is side by side, yes, it's nothing, uh, you know, out of the ordinary by Talladega standards. As you can see, Gregson going to get into force at the outside. The biggest thing that I think the non-SIM drivers have to get used to, Justin, is being able to read, you know, the structures. There's a oh. big mess behind. First caution of the night, the 44 car involved in that one, Tommy Joe Martins. But he is hardly the only driver. He was behind a big mess that I think started with Haley. Yeah, it almost, I think it was more so Brett Moffat where it started off, if anything, because there was a checkup big time where Gregson got a shot from Brandon Brown. Moffat had to slam on the brakes. He got shoved by Ankrum, and that's where you've seen Haley get shuffled up the racetrack and all of the air drivers get collected. That's where the risk comes in 
if you're at the back of the field as well is, do you have enough of time to react? Are you further, further away enough, rather, to make sure you keep yourself out of trouble for some of the drivers who were dropping back, Mike Allgaier? The answer was no. And some of these drivers have their actual real-world spotters in the sim with them, but others either have somebody else or just do not have a live spotter, and that's where it could be challenging for them to figure out where that checkup is. And kind of fitting that just as we were about to talk of it, that's the cause of the caution. Look at the outside line. You'll see that Anna Gregson stick out to the outside because he got too much of a run. Then behind the 68 is going to check up. The 23 gets put into the outside wall. He comes down, tags Justin Haley, who caught my eye initially, and that's where the wreck is on. And Tim, not only is it unfortunate to have the yellow flag this early on, but going to be a, kind of spoiling what should be a great night for Brett Moffat, obviously recovering uh, from fracturing to both of his legs not that long ago and using iRacing basically as, uh, you know, kind of a, a small step in that rehab process to just kind of race whatever he can now. Well, he uh, recovers back to full health and uh, one of the drivers involved in that accident, as you see towards the back of the pack, a lot of pit road takers. Yeah, great to see him out here and uh, he'll be able to come down and use that reset if he wants to and get that brand new car, but Kyle Weatherman was kind of lonely down there on pit road at the front of the field. Everybody kind of duped him to come down on a pit road. So Christian Eckes, Bailey Curry, Alex LeBay, most of your top 10 stay out. Weatherman down with uh, a bunch of the back half of the field. So he's not going to be at the back unless something happens on this pit stop. He should be around 20th place or so as you saw those drivers in behind the pace truck. And here is your line off pit road to see who wins that race off pit road. But obviously with Weatherman giving up that position early, Justin, uh, aside from pitting here to get damage repaired, that's really the only thing I could understand. And that's why the cars at the back of the pack would make it because we were just talking to fuel strategy uh, in our separate radio channel. And about 35 laps or so is that fuel range. So you do need to get close uh, to halfway to get that take it on. But that's not the only layer of strategy because obviously, and, and we say this every week with this, and we'll continue to explain it because it is a new world and I racing and sim racing for those who may not be familiar that quick repair is basically a brand new race car entirely you hit the pit stall it's a brand new car and you can get back out there to racing but if they did not have that available they'd have to sit and get the damage repaired so drivers with minimal damage from that yellow could say listen i don't want to burn my fast repair in case i get in an incident later they may actually opt to sit in the box and sit down there for a couple of minutes to get the race car fixed it'll never get back to 100 percent but keeping that quick repair in the back pocket these are kind of those you uniquely sim racing uh, strategies and, and things that these drivers uh, as well as everybody at home maybe if you're not uh, you know normally a sim racing fan are, are still learning yeah absolutely and that's where some of the importance of having a crew chief or a spotter with you to help talk you through that decision making comes into play at the same time there are many times i've seen evan in many races at talladega where drivers elect to pit and regroup as a whole entire team by going to the back. That's what I think a few of the drivers may have took the chance to do, top off on fuel to have an extra five to seven laps and to try and see what happens if they get a long run because in turn, they have that advantage in the fuel tank. Still a lot of things to try and unravel though for the rest of these drivers. It's still one stopper, mind you, on the fuel regardless. It's just the matter of if you want to be conservative, you want to try and have that extra fuel in the back of your pocket just in case you need it. It's always a good idea, Tim, especially with this format. As we take a look up front, the lights on top of the pace truck are out, and we are going to restart the next time by because just because I have 35 laps of fuel does not mean I'm going to pit at 35 laps to go. We have up to three attempts at a green white checkered, and we've seen drivers lose races at Talladega in the past because it goes way into overtime, and uh, they did not account for that. So that's why uh, that little bit of a buffer would certainly be a good idea. Yeah, you want to make sure that you can get to the end of this race and make sure you have enough fuel. So if you can get a little closer or a little further on this first stint to get some gas in that race car to get to the end, uh, you might be a little bit better off. And mentioned earlier that Kyle Weatherman would probably start around 20th place or so unless he had an issue on pit road. He scored in 32nd position, so he must have had some sort of issue on pit road. And now he's got more work cut out for him as he was up in front. This is the first time all evening, Evan. We're really going to be able to see him run some traffic because keep in mind, he was up in front for his heat race. 
Yeah, he was pretty comfortable uh, for the heat race in for the start of this one. So the number is going to be 13. Your top 13 drivers did not come down to pit road. So therefore, 14th on the back, led by Todd Gilliland, uh, going to be the drivers who did come down. And again, that could be uh, for a range of surface, from tires to fuel to damage repair, quick fixes, uh, and anything else that those drivers may have wanted to take care of uh, under the yellow flag. But, uh, you know, a relatively big incident, Justin, to get this one kicked off now that uh, there's a significant portion of the field who may not to have that quick repair anymore do we maybe see more drivers lay off in that back to mid pack and, and not force as many two and three wide scenarios i mean that's what i would do play the race that smart and make sure you don't even have to be in the concern range of having to use a fast repair at all just think big picture get yourself to the pit stop window then that's where I think the intensity is going to pick up even more so once this race gets back in the way. And it is going to do so right now. Pace truck off it in. It is the 81's field to control. Christian Eck is per iRacing to restart procedure. Could go whenever, but unlike at every other racetrack, it had a big jump, probably not the best of ideas. So he'll hold them at pace speed of 65 miles an hour through the tri-oval into the green flag. We're back underway, and that is a big jump for Eck is still. He's about three car lengths out in front of LeBay, and it opens up the door for Bailey Curry to go to Top the low. And we've got a third line already forming. Let up by Noah breaks in on the outside. He pops back down to the inside line. Will Rogers is there as well as they try to get up to speed and figure out where they want to run and what line they want to pick. Rogers is currently the first one on the outside three wide. Breaks and thinking about it. And they are fanning out way wide down. Look at the move by the 68 car of Brandon Brown. Gregson was on a third lane, even though there was only one car to the bottom. And as Noah tried to get down to that middle, Brown actually went from the bottom up, took the spot away, and it's going to give the nine car a one-way ticket to the back of this pack because now he's once again stranded on the outside without any drafting support. And up front it is Anthony Alfredo, pushed by Stenzel to the race lead. Nine laps to the books, and a 33 Chevy dropping to the bottom. Yeah, it looks like Alfredo looking comfortable now on that bottom side. Here's the thing, though, for everybody else. It's going to be the matter of does that top line form up the top line is the faster line down the straightaways to be able to pick up more momentum. You need to have the right amount of cars, though, to be able to carry that speed. Just two cars are hooked up on that top line, and about four others are scattered right behind Brown. And this is basically a virtual visor cam with Brandon Brown, almost identical to the view that he's, he has seen in his sim rig at home. And that inside line opens up. He drops right down to fill that hole. And Scott Stenzel now, you see the 63, going to be dropping it back on his right-hand side. Now picked up by Stephen Light, who doesn't really want to work with him. Light wanted to go three wide, but Will Rogers said, now oh, maybe not the best of ideas. Rogers stays the middle, and through all that, it actually ends up biting the 25 Toyota. And the first time we've really seen Chase Cabry near the front of the field this evening. Uh, finished 18th place when it came to his heat race and now methodically working his way up towards the front of the field on the back bumper of the 55 of Rogers. There's light on your screen getting back into line. That outside line or that second groove now has Alex LeBay on the outside line from position number four as they try to get up there. You're right on board with Stephen Light. Four cars on the outside. That inside line is packed tight as they come out of four. The inside, outside, both pretty tight together, but now Roger is going to take that step to the right. He wants to go 3-1, and he has Chase Cabry offering the drafting support. We've seen groups of two, three, and maybe even four at one moment go to that third lane, but I just don't think that's the magic number that's going to get it done. You need some more support, and we know as we could see that sustained three wide through the pack a little bit later on, but I think with the players up front who are actually you know, wanting to push that envelope and kind of get after it here early, not enough of them to sustain three lanes. So Rogers, Cabri, they drop back down in line. And again, with Anthony Alfredo going top to bottom, he now has to kind of ride around Justin, leading that bottom. You're not really going to see drivers on the inside making passes. You mentioned the top's the faster way around. That's why Alex LeVay's sitting pretty, because if he can get a shove from Scott Stenzel, he could be lined up right here to go for the lead. It looks like Stenzel, though, might be a little bit hot. That's why he's not trying to push the bumper. Still enough momentum, though, because that straightaway, if they wanted to, they could have taken it. 
Looks like, though, LeBay wants to try and get Stenzel clear as well before they try and go to the bottom side. Because that's one of the main things as friends if you have them on the racetrack. You want to be able to control not just that bottom line, but the top line as well, and control that bubble and how the lanes are dictated. That's what these drivers are trying to do. Just not working out for them to get clear yet. And obviously this draft is the big important factor here at figuring out plate racing. These drivers uh, top up it out at speeds of 198 miles an hour through the pack. They're currently lapping consistently at lap times four seconds faster than they did in their single car qualifying session. So it is really the single determinant factor in uh, obviously finding success in a plate race like this. Again, exactly like it is in the real world. And LeBay honestly might have been clear of the 33 of Alfredo there, did not go to the bottom. So he'll stay on the outside right now, maybe opting to stick with Stenzel or even Tim. We've seen drivers just not like the bottom. And even if they get clear, try to control the outside lanes. And that outside lane right now, falling back a little bit in the middle of the corner. Stenzel giving a little push to LeBay. He's right on board with Will Rogers in position number three on the outside line. And up goes Christian Eckes to the outside line. The 81 car wants to go to the front and try to lead this thing. Anthony Alfredo continues to work that inside. Great shot of the field as they come through the tri-oval and complete lap number 14. And now a little bit of uh, disconjoining on the inside line. A little bit of a bobble. Chase Cavery moves to the outside. These boys are starting to get racy. We talk about all the different series uh, represented. I'm at the NASCAR Whale and Modified Tour with Donnie Leah down on the inside line. A new face to Saturday Night Thunder driving uh, an 07 Toyota. This one, the inside, they're going to jack up in front of them. And that was the 19 car abandoning ship diving out of the way was Derek Krause, who did not like what he was seeing. And it's going to be a big discombobulated three wide in traffic with race leaders actually more kind of uh, in line with that two by two up front. And it is a big push by LeBay goes for the undercut on Eckes. He pushed Eckes to the lead and then dove low before Eckes could do so. And that's how the Nadia LeBay now leads the bottom. Yeah, and this is where the revolving door almost begins now. And it almost puts Stenzel into the helper car on that top line. Anytime someone wants to try and retake the lead, he might be in a spot where once Eckes tries to get clear, someone else might jump in front of that 63 machine. Then that cycle potentially can keep on going and going, and that's the trickiness of trying to plan things out as a driver. Stenzel at this point just has to try and ride until he can get himself as the lead car for that top line. And that's kind of the revolving door is you certainly can't win this race at lap number 16, but you certainly can lose it. And, uh, you know, unlike in a points championship, uh, Tim, if, if this were the EDAS car Coca-Cola iRacing series, we'd be talking about, well, you can get out there and get some bonus points and try to lock into a playoff. But there is no you know, keeping track of points in this Saturday Night Thunder series. So the only thing. Up for grabs tonight of note is that virtual checkered flag at the end and that with the drivers who do not want to be up front and, uh, you know, who we really haven't talked a bunch about tonight, but I'm sure we'll join the fray later. Uh, obviously, they've taken that to heart. And we've got 20 plus cars still in this lead draft and a couple of drivers kind of snaking on the back as we've seen in some of these shots. Three wide as Stephen Light goes to the outside. He's going to lose at least one more position and behind he goes on Noah Gregson. But you see those shots, at least 20 cars in this lead pack and a couple of cars trying to maybe sit there, ride, try to figure out what they're going to do. It's, if you look at Scott Stencil right now, he is inside the hornet's nest and he's well within. If something does happen, somebody makes a slip. He could be in it as there goes Christian Eckes to the inside and now Stencil leads the outside line. Yeah, so the outside lags back a little bit when they go into the corner up that 33 degrees of banking, but it is vice versa now as they rocket down the Alabama gang back straight away. And that is now they come off of the bank. You didn't have all that speed in their favor. Lapped car, the seven of Justin Allgaier going to hold the outside line. And it is very easy for these drivers to find space underneath to safely get on through. And that one goes without any fireworks, but working lap number 18 of 57 in this one. Seeing a lot of familiar faces. Doesn't matter just that it seems what car, what track, and what format we use for Saturday Night Thunder. A lot of these drivers up front have been good in all of them. 
especially LeBay in my opinion, because he's shown he's been great at the, at the short tracks, was really good at Texas a few weeks back in the cup car. He's been great as well here on the super speedway. Alex LeBay has absolutely been impressive this entire time, throughout this entire time in Saturday Night Thunder. And I think is definitely putting a lot of people towards this direction, what they're seeing with him in terms of per performance so far as he leads that top group still. And it looks like we've seen a lot less of those drivers trying to make third lanes. I know you see a driver up on the third lane, but it does not pay off for Stephen Light and he tucks back down in line. But it seems like these drivers may be of content is the right word. I don't think they're, you know, hanging out right now, but certainly uh, maybe less antsy to, to go, go, go and realize, hey, we still got pit cycles to get through and much more as we saw Greg said, maybe sticking it out out to get some air to it. We already saw a car blow the engine earlier in one of the heat races and uh, obviously that's a concern uh, when you're running long races like this and uh, maybe that's why when you see drivers kind of stick the nose out on the straights, that could be an explanation. Noah may have went for a slide more than anything down there in one and two, was able to keep control of that race car and keep control of position number four on the outside line, currently position number eight is the 51 of Vargas, takes a look to the inside, trying to pick up one more position, that inside line gets the momentum and out of corner number four, the Outside car now is the Anthony Alfredo number 33. Hops up in front of Alex LeBay. Alfredo wants to go to the lead. They're side by side coming across the line and give it to Alfredo as he will lead that lap. And will he go back down to the inside? Certainly he will. But he did not want to stick around. And, you know, in the old days of tandem drafting, you would see that one car would push, he would get hot, slide up, and get around. And that's kind of the plate racing equivalent. As look at Akis from behind, looking high, looking low, obviously not coordinating with Anthony Alfredo because he was doing the opposite of whatever the 33 car was trying to do. And just as quickly as Anthony Alfredo took the race lead, he made just to lose it here because Akis, about a couple inches from being clear off turn four let's see if LeBay gives him enough of a push as Alfredo dependent on a shove uh, from the 74 of Bailey Curry second in line down on the bottom but Akis has got it he'll slide down and right back to the lead I'm not sure if I like the decision from Alfredo to do that at that specific moment because yes there's the importance of keeping clean air on the race lead and trying to maintain that momentum on the bottom side but it's lap 21 at that time now we're lap 22 that's where you end up potentially getting in trouble. And those are the types of moves I think I think we're all expecting once the race intensity picks up, once everyone has to come down since we're reaching the green light to make it on fuel in the next lap or so. Yeah, we talked about 35 or so laps going to be the magic number in this time by going to be 35 exactly laps to go in this Saturday Night Thunder 150. Of course, though, with up to three attempts at a green white checkered overtime finish, I uh, would not expect them to flock to the pit lane now. Uh, maybe waiting a little bit closer uh, to that cross flags point in this one. Ronnie on board with the 68 machine of Brandon Brown, third in line outside. Started 23rd, Tim, but admittedly feels like he's been in this battle up front for most of it. He's been hanging around the top 10 for a while now, Evan, and trying to figure out what he can do. And look at the outside line. He's going to go. To the upside, he's going to go three wide, but it's going to be all by himself. Everybody else on those bottom two groups, Harrison Burton getting into this here as well. He'll pass the 68 of Brandon Brown, the 38 of Gilliland coming up as well. The 68 is falling to the back of this lead pack in a hurry. Now he's outside the top 10, and he's got some work to do. And again, uh, single car goes to the third lane, doesn't get drafted help, but uh, in drops to the back. Uh, rinse, wash, and repeat. We've seen that a few times already here in the opening go uh, from Talladega. But obviously, now into the longest green flag run that we've seen so far tonight. Just that one yellow flag a little bit earlier on, but it was a big pass down in, in turn number three. These drivers, I think, JP, have settled into a rhythm. They're rounding around a little bit. They're still drivers experimenting, trying to think, hey, you know, if I go to the outside, I might own is it going to work who may go with me you know, formulate a plan so when we get down to those final 10 or 5 they're not totally riding blind yeah and that's what some of these drivers think are just trying to feel well uh, do they feel comfortable again at the back of the pack or do they feel like they need to get up towards the front remember a decent chunk of the field stayed out on the last caution flag 
they're on the start of their 24th lap, including the caution flag laps. Everyone else has an extra six laps advantage to go further on the fuel tank. So that dynamic can also come into play. And many times, drivers may elect to tandem draft their way up to the front of the pack once the window is open and they know drivers are about to pit because that might be their way of being one of the lead cars after the pit stop. So that's something to keep in mind here. In fact, that's happening now with Stephen Light and Ankrum on the top line with Moffat. The low car you saw on the apron was Spencer Boyd. He was falling a lap down after losing the draft. And you can see him there, stayed onto the apron, no worries. And once more, that third lane effort is cut very short. But you know, a lot of the time, Tim, people don't really understand the importance of executing and coordinating pit stops at Talladega. You're coming off of the quarter at about 194, 95 miles an hour in the draft. By the way, the top speed tonight was uh, issued by Joe Graff Jr. He did 199.5, so almost cracking the 200 mile an hour barrier in these Xfinity cars. But you have to get it down to pace speed here at Talladega of 55 miles an hour hard on the brakes oftentimes two and three wide while doing so as there's a check up on the outside with Stenzel and Gregson but you have to doesn't matter what you do in the box you can't enter pit road by yourself and you can't afford to leave pit road on your own either you need help yeah you have to get by with a little help from your friends and uh, we'll see who decides to come down on a pit road and who comes off a pit road with each other. And oh, by the way, you can't make those mistakes, as you mentioned, coming down from race speed down to the 55 miles an hour. You can't speed on pit road because that's going to end your night. If you have that quick repair, do you gamble to use it now? If you're at the back of the pack and maybe have a little bit of damage, there's all kinds of pit stop strategy we're going to see here, especially if this thing stays green. Coming up on that halfway point here in just a couple laps, we're going to really start seeing who wants to throw their strategy out and come down on the pit road and stick their nose out. And speaking about sticking the nose out, Noah Gregson's been looking for that high side the last couple laps. He's really been trying. The checkup uh, previous was when it was actually Alex LeBay who left the middle open, and Scott Stenzel thought about it, opted not to. He checked the nine car up, and uh, we've seen a couple of times that I know I have to kind of dive to the outside uh, to keep things safe, and now it looks like uh, the uh, token outside line car in the 26 of Tyler Anker, who keeps looking, uh, but is not going to commit yet. And it's run on board with Noah Gregson, third in line on the outside, started this race just outside of the top 10 but has been a top 10 car for most of it and uh, you can see as with lap traffic up high and old guy that's uh, his teammate that he was working with in the heat race uh, they'll just hold the middle line and uh, go on through without issue but notice how he's not pushing stenzel stenzel is pushing lebay and it's smart of course uh, you don't want to get three cars hooked up together with that one in the middle oftentimes becomes uh, the ping pong ball Evan, they've actually at some points nearly hooked up four drivers and we have pit stops in the backdrop. Stephen Light just ducked down this time by, I believe, on his own though. Yeah, that's not what you want. He did get to pit speed safely uh, down to the uh, the commitment code, the yellow commitment code on entry, but he is all on his own. Uh, again, we just said that, uh, well, yes, it is going to be easier to enter the pit lane on your own. Uh, you do need drafting support or you're going to be that four seconds or so slower every single lap blend back out and onto the racetrack but maybe tim now that we're past halfway in this saturday night thunder 150 uh, that the bank is open and we could see that big swing oh there's contact it's stenzel into the outside wall he is into the fence in three and a caution flag flies after he got hooked from the outside that's a tough break for those drivers running up front and running so close we almost saw that happen evan a couple laps ago with those two up in front and it just so happened that the second time around, they weren't as lucky. Noah Gregson, though, is uh, going to have to use that quick repair on that number nine. And some of these uh, pit crews are going to be busy. And all that green flag talk that we talked about, green flag pit stops, we're going to throw that out the window for now. And these guys are going to have to get on pit road and see what they can do to get themselves a little more track position. Second half of the race, that big pitcher starts to become a little bit smaller. That take becomes a little more as... Uh, we get ready to see some of the, the take and, and the give up in front that might not have been there as uh, the caution flag flies again. And just as I mentioned, the dangers of getting three cars pushed together, that's what happened is Gregson got in that trio, and you just cannot safely push three cars like that. 
as they all bounce off each other. And of course, Stencil into the fence and Gregson around for the second caution flag of this main event. So the pit stops are going to take place for a majority of the field, Justin Prince, under the yellow flag. Could this stand to benefit, though, the cars who have already pitted and may not need to right now? Yeah, I mentioned Stephen Light coming on his own. That may have been the gift of the night for that to come at that time, to stay on the lead lap. As long as he can catch up to the field, there's a chance he cycles to the race lead because of the time of the caution flag. That could be absolutely huge. He was running about mid-pack much of the night. So here's the big swing of cars down and into the pit lane. You'll notice there's no actual virtual crew members on the track, but on each driver sim, they will see their crew come over the wall, jack the cars up, and give them tires and fuel and whatever service they may want. Eck is the first car in in pit stall number three. You're going to go for the right side service. Obviously, gas to go the distance. And damn, these drivers going for four, or some of them going for four, as Eck has completes his service there, and he'll be the first car off of pit road. And they are going to race off pit road behind. You can see the green car in the background. That is Stephen Light. So Stephen came back down pit road under this yellow flag. So he will not be cycling to the lead on this exchange as the field completes their service back onto the racetrack. They will go and get a collective breath here because I think these final 27 laps are going to be even more intense than what we saw all night long as there is the field coming back out onto the racing surface to collect the back of the pacing field. And what you will notice now is Harrison Burton in the number 20 Dex Imaging Toyota Supra out in front. He did come to the pit lane, but he did not make a stop. He missed his pit stall, and that is obviously going to cost him very dearly because needing fuel uh, to go the distance, I'm expecting him to come back in. Yeah, he's going to need to come back down and get that fuel. And already letting a couple drivers go, in fact, at this point after missing the pit boxes. Surprisingly, too, Stephen Light elected to come in to the pit lane despite the fact he just came in for fuel, so might be with, working with the spotter on the conservative round as well in this race. But a few decent, or a few drivers, I should rather say, who've had quiet nights making their way up to the front. Donnie Lee is now lined up in eighth position after pit stops. And you can see, uh, of course, the first car behind the pace car there is not Christian Eckes. So with a couple of drivers looking for a wave by, that'll be Ty Gibbs who stays out. That should get him back to the lead lap, but along with Justin Allgaier and Boer. But let's kind of recap where everybody's running and take a look top to bottom at your current running order. And it's all spearheaded right now by Christian Eckes. The number 81 machine uh, is going to be your race leader when this cycles back through. And you can see Burton scored up top at the moment uh, of it serving uh, that penalty and having to come back down to the pit lane. He'll drop off of that spot. But it'll be Eckes one, Curry two, and Will Rogers in third position. All of these drivers have started up here. The likes of Alex LeBay, Anthony Alfredo, Ryan Vargas. But then it gets interesting. How about Tommy Joe Martins, 19th on the grid? Donnie Leah, who Justin just mentioned, Tim, started 27th on the grid. Those are the drivers making a splash to was the tail end of that top 10. Yeah, I kind of like Donnie Leah as a sleeper pick. He does a lot of racing on the service, including some private leagues, uh, Sim 500. He's over there almost every single night doing some racing. So uh, if you're looking for a sleeper pick here tonight, uh, you might not think the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour would be a super speedway type uh, that you'd be able to really grasp. But Donnie Leah does a lot of racing here on the iRacing service. So uh, keep an eye on that 07. I don't think he's done this evening well within the top 10. And with a clean car heading towards the second half of this event as you see him on your screen christian eck is continuing to lead this thing as you mentioned those drivers have been running up front most of the night uh eck is lebay alfredo uh, some of those drivers like josh berry uh chase cabry back there about middle of the pack right now just outside the top 10 they're going to start making their way back up towards the front of the field too so this is going to be a very interesting about 25 laps or so when we go green and just looking at the way that this race is shaking out now, we thought that the green flag pit stops were kind of going to be that big pivot point where drivers had a real opportunity to make a difference. And instead now, Justin, it's all going to be determined based on uh, kind of that virtual gusto skill and a little bit of uh, luck on top because uh, now assuming – uh, that, you know, we don't go way, way past schedule distance. All these drivers uh, kind of good to go uh, through to the scheduled 
end of this race. But you had mentioned earlier talking about some of the top drivers in this one, and, and I had mentioned as well that a lot of them have found a lot of success. How about Alex LeBay? We talked about the, the different drivers involved in this series. We were just talking about Donnie Leah, the Whalen uh, driver representing, and Alex LeBay, the lone driver of the NASCAR Pinty Series. He won a qualifying race a couple of weeks back at Texas, which actually allowed him to race in to the Pro Invitational race from there, and ever since then has been one of the strongest showers in Saturday Night Thunder. Yeah, people seem to forget as well. He used to at one point actually own his own iRacing League in the late 2010s, around 2017-ish, and drove with guys like Ryan Ellis in those types of races. Uh, Ryan Reed was among some of the drivers. Uh, a couple other competitors that race in the Xfinity Series today also were a part of the series he competed in. So he, he's been somebody that does race a fair bit on the service and has an experience on the service. Talked about it at Bear Bristol. He's been very smart in his moves tonight here at Talladega, Evan. And continuing with that, uh, you know, kind of topic of drivers with success, Tim and drivers very familiar to the iRacing service. We mentioned uh, that uh, the last couple of weeks with this, we were in uh, Bristol with the Arkham Menard Series styled cars. And last week, we're at Richmond in these Xfinity Series machines. And it was a walk in the park, seemingly, for Josh Berry, the driver out of Hedersonville, Tennessee, uh, who, again, is no slouch on the sim or in the real world. Martinsville, late model stock 300 winner. He's won a bunch on the cars, Solid Rock Carriers Tour. He's been doing some Arkham Menard Series racing. And on the sim, he's been racing with the Replacement Series. He did the NASCAR Roots program on when, or, uh, Monday night. He's done the Grand National Tour as well. So not only has he been doing some racing on the big tracks and on the super speedways, he's also been doing some short track racing as well. And, of course, we mentioned the big Saturday Night Thunder win as well so uh, josh berry has been racking up the virtual hardware but he's got some work to do fell to the back of the field early in this one and was riding in almost the second pack evan but now he's up in the middle it's almost go time i wouldn't say it's exactly go time right now they're going to come to 24 laps to go and we take the green you still can't win the race with 24 laps to go but you can position yourself to put yourself in a spot to win the race coming up uh, on that 57th lap and compared to the 10 lap heat races that we had earlier, it seems like a marathon still, but at any, uh, you know, normal sort, uh, 24 to go at Talladega is very much crunch time. Again, basically, when you get inside that final fuel stop and we are good to go the distance, it is time to buckle up and to go out there and get the job done. If you're not top five, top 10, now's your chance, uh, kind of been packed to start making those moves. And maybe now's the time where we see more drivers willing uh, to go to that third lane if they still need to pick up positions in bulk. The base car, though, down it in. It's Christian Akis's field to control in his number 81 Safe Flight Toyota Supra. Green flag back in the air. 24 laps to go from Talladega. And a bit too good of a launch there, I think, Evan, compared to the rest of the pack. That's going to allow the whole bottom line to suck up and very quickly to try and get a move here. And this is where I expected the intensity level to start to pick up here because most of the field, in fact, the whole field, good on fuel from here. It was the second time in a row that Eck is in control, got a big jump, and now as his drafting support and Will Rogers gets to his bumper, it doesn't matter because look at Bailey Curry go. The 74 being pushed by Alex LeBay already for much longer than Eck has had to wait for, and it's going to cost him the race lead, so too good of a start at Talladega. An issue there, and it's Curry dropping down to the bottom to lead the inside, which will leave a duo of Alex LeBay and Ryan Vargas up top. Get Donnie Lee and Brandon Brown up there as well as Eckes goes a little bit off that inside line, kind of pushes Alex LeBay up a little bit. Ryan Vargas on his back bumper, you ride on board with the 51 as they push towards the lead, down into corner number one, a great entry to that corner. The shortest way around on the inside though, gonna be Bailey Curry with a little help from Christian Eckes. That outside line though looks pretty tight. We'll see what they can do down the back straightaway. And notably, nobody from that second lane abandoned it to try a third lane. So I think the outside working so well right now because they don't have those defectors and uh, you have the numbers and support. A little bit of a bobble that time. Center for Ryan Farkas. Uh, but he's going to be all right. And Alex LeBay going to get crossed up because here it comes. Zekis, he'll slide to the outside line and he wants to take the race lead back from Bailey Curry. He's going to do it with ease now to the start finish. 
massive difference in speed between the top and bottom lines for that to happen right there. But now this gives LeBay the chance to try and set up a pass if he can get enough run. Couple of cars around though into turn one. It's going to be behind your race leaders. There's a handful of them. Stenzel, Light involved, Justin Haley and others. But the track appears that it is going to be clean. And we talked about the live admin caution. So the track will not be uh, obstructed by the time your race leaders come on by. So we are able to stay green flag racing. No caution for that incident at the back of the pack. Look at LeBay now. Just went back to the lead on the outside. Slid down low. And just as quickly as it happened, it'll fall away. Because Christian Eck is darted right back to the outside. Refusing to push the 90 car. This has been some great racing up near the front of the field, Evan, as these drivers are jockeying for position, going back and forth. There's another move to the inside for Christian Eckes. It leaves Ryan Vargas as your leader on the outside line, trying to pick up one more position and get up there to the lead, but they fall back a little bit in the middle of the corner. Alex LeBay goes high and leaves Christian Eckes to the inside. That outside line starts to form again. It gets tight. Donnie Leah gets a shot from Brandon Brown as Alex LeBay goes to the lead. He gets that nose out in front, but not enough to drop it down to the bottom. But now the third line may be happening. And how's this for a duo? Chase Cabry going to be pushed by the 88 machine of Josh Berry from behind. In front of them, Donnie Leah going to go for the middle of the bottom. As we look on the board with the 88 machine, it's not going to pan out, though. Berry going to leave the four. Now a lot of shuffling and going around here as these drivers now to try and set themselves up to battle for the race win. You never know what's gonna happen though again because especially with so many cars down to the bottom of the racetrack lap traffic, it could get messy here. And that's the concern is some of these drivers may have already used up that quick repair. Look at the seven car adjusted. Old guy, our lap traffic going to hold the bottom and it's going to force the leaders to go forward. It's not going to work. Donnie Leah spins. He gets Tommy Joe Martins. The 44 is going to be OK, but we do have a caution. A couple of close calls there, but the yellow flag will fly with 20 laps remaining, and that could have been a lot bigger than it was. Donnie Leah going to have the opportunity to uh, catch his breath a little bit because I think there's uh, probably a couple of tense moments there to come down maybe to pit road and get some of that damage repaired because there definitely is some damage. You can see it on the left rear, especially that corner's not looking uh, pristine as it did when it rolled off the grid. So the yellow does fly for that one, and we'll get a look here in just a moment. But uh, it was Justin Allgaier who was slow, some about 13 or 14 miles an hour slower not being in the draft. And all night long, Justin, we had seen lapped cars hold the top to allow the leaders to not have to snake through. But I think Allgaier dropping a lap down there wanted to hold the bottom to kind of get sucked up and absorbed by that lead pack. So we could just kind of hang out with them and maybe be a lucky dog a little bit later on. The problem was that lead pack was going three wide just as they did that and it forced four wide and we were not getting away with that one exactly what he's probably thinking especially since that put him two laps down with the time to the caution flag he probably was thinking if i go on the top again there's a chance i don't hook up to the back end of the pack if i stay on the bottom and force the pack to swallow me up that's where he can potentially stay within two laps down range and still have somewhat of a chance as the race goes on but there's the issue again, as you talked about, of the three wide. They were really getting dicey at that moment, and it was just so many drivers were fighting for the same piece of real estate at the exact same time, I think, especially Gilliland and Leah, that there was not enough time for some of the drivers to react to the seven being at the bottom, especially in turn three. So as we pace here at Talladega, working uh, and now actually completing lap number 39, let's take a second look at some of the chaos. And uh, this was uh, that earlier contact that we talked about from behind. Check this out. You can see the race leaders up in front. There's the wreck down into one. A handful of drivers involved. Eckes, uh, you know, the 19 of machine actually of uh, Kraus was that driver. Spinning it across the racetrack. You can see heavy damage to the 92 car of Josh Williams. And... That was uh, one of the incidents behind your lead pack. And that's going to take out a couple of drivers, especially if they use the quick repair already and they don't have it at their disposal. Kyle Weatherman being in that one. We talked about him running up front and running so strong up front, but ever since he's got back in traffic, it seems like he's had some problem trying to get back up. 
towards the front of the field. So lots of action here at Talladega coming down to the late laps of this one. Eckes, Bailey Curry, Alex LeBay, Vargas, Rogers, names that we've talked about all night long being up front. Then you start seeing some drivers. Evan, in the second half of that top 10, driver from 36 spot up to 8, Todd Gilliland has worked his way up. Jesse Awuji, haven't talked a whole lot about him this evening either, knocking on the door of the top 10, currently sitting in 12. There's a whole bunch of drivers there as well. Uh, you know, Drew Dollar, Jeb Burton, drivers who, uh, you know, we find they're mentioned uh, just at a passing or, of course, on the grid, but we're quiet. And that's the point that I mentioned earlier that now in this last run, maybe those drivers can serve. You know, be the ones that we don't talk much about tonight. You know, they're not going to be the plus uh, 20s and the plus 15s on the leaderboard early. They hang out, keep their car clean, and now we're basically seeing, Justin, that any incidents from this point on, and uh, you know, can't exactly pinpoint who and who not, uh, but it's likely, I guess, uh, that any further incidents will start to take drivers out of this race now that those faster pair, the, the only faster pair, one and only available, are starting to get burnt up. Yeah, and don't be surprised if more drivers stay on the bottom because, hey, listen, in real life, that's what they recommend you do. Stay along the O-line, bottom of the racetrack, and stay out of harm's way that way. That's no fault what just happened to the caution, with the caution flag with Allgaier. He was following what, was, what you do in real life. But to loop back once again to that discussion point we talked about again in terms of how much could happen with some of these cars... I think we're going to see a lot of drivers trying to get a third line going now because if you're in the back half of the field or in the teens, I don't think you're in the best position to try and contend. You're going to need to have a couple cars to work with to get up towards the front. If you're in the top 15, I think you still are in a decent shot here, Evan. And just looking up to the front of the field, the lights on top of the pace truck stay on. So at least uh, a couple more times around under pacing, Tim. And uh, this makes it only more difficult for the cars in the back because now you lose three, four good laps of, you know, try to advance your position. And, you know, one would like to think you get a yellow that on the next restart, drivers will take it easy to not get one. But if I'm in the bottom 50% of the field, I'm thinking the opposite. I'm thinking I have less laps to make it happen, and I need to get up and on the wheel. One driver that has been, though, so far tonight, the driver of the 55-4. That's Will Rogers, who's in fifth position, and I believe, Tim, we've got him on the radio. Yeah, Will Rogers running up here in the top five. Will, you got a copy? Yeah, I got you guys. What's going on? Yeah, we're enjoying a great race here at Talladega. You're running in the top five. What do you have to do? What moves do you have to make to try to win this race tonight? Oh, man, so far it's kind of just been a, all about survival, obviously. We've had a few cautions here, and, and we've kind of gotten the lucky end of the stick, and, and I hope to keep that ball rolling because I think it's going to start to get a little hairy up here. But uh, I think just staying dedicated um, um, to, to you know kind of what my plan is, and that is staying conservative until the last you know five or so laps. And if we can get there and we can be with uh, a, a good you know leader or pusher maybe somebody like my buddy ryan vargas who's right in front of me i think we could go get this thing so uh just got to keep it clean until then well it's clean right now we wish you all the best go get them and we'll uh, talk to you in victory lane after the race right thanks guys appreciate it there you go evan that's will rogers he talked about staying committed and i think you have to do that we saw that third line a little right, bit I'm start back. to form a little bit as well so we'll see what transpires here over these next 17 laps work together is uh, they're not going to be on the same row or the same lane for the restart uh, what'll be in what'll be out but that goes back to the point that we mentioned off at of the top of the broadcast uh, that those allegiances justin could be crucial very crucial indeed and for drivers like vargas they're in a scenario where there's not too many jd motorsports machines around them at this point remember jeffrey earnhardt missed the cut I believe Ryan Vargas actually jumping in with us right now in the race car. Ryan, do you have a copy? Yep, we got you. Yeah, we're on the radio with the driver uh, of that 50 Buddha machine. Ryan, I know the lights are out on the pace truck, so uh, we'll be brief here, but I, I'm certain you're happy to be back behind the wheel of the Xfinity Series machine, although virtually. But how's your night gone so far? It's gone really good. You know, just avoiding all the messes, playing a safe and safe and uh, courteous strategy with my spotter, Gabe Heschel. Um, you know, the car is as fast as Xfinity Internet right now, and uh, I'm just really glad to have Cranio Care Bears and the uh, National Cranio Facial Association on the car. I, uh, I hope they're getting, uh, getting a kick out of seeing their car up front. 
It's certainly been a lot of good TV time tonight. We just chatted uh, with Will Rogers behind you in P5. Benji, you guys might want to try to work together here. Is it going to take somebody that's going to be loyal and stick with you to get the win when this thing gets crazy at the end? 100%. Um, it's it's definitely a game of teammates. You could definitely tandem for about half a lap if you really try to and if you're gentle with it. Um, I definitely think if me and Will can get lined up say with like two or three to go, it could be a really good pairing. It's been a good night so far, Ryan. Best of luck here. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for the coverage. The P4 runner right now as the caution fly gets set to, to complete. Big thanks uh, to Ryan and Will uh, for chatting with us as they run at fourth and fifth, respectively, on the racetrack. And you heard it right there firsthand, Tim, that it is going to take some allegiances to make this happen. You got to stay committed. You got to have friends. And you got to figure out what line is going to work at the end of this. I think we're at the point now, Evan, when we talked about that big picture at the start of the show, you need to start positioning yourself, as Justin mentioned, in the top 15, top 10. Try to get yourself a little bit closer to the field. Get in that line that's going to run. And oh, by the way, you're going to take a little more now than you would have given about 15 laps ago. It's almost go time here as the pace truck dies off the racetrack. Third time in a row that Christian Eckes will control the restart, this time, though, alongside the 74 of Bailey Curry. We're going to put 42 laps behind us. Restart with 15 laps to go for the virtual Talladega Super Speedway. Can Eckes nail the restart? He's almost been too far out in front. The last few green flag flies. We're back underway through the gears to turn one. And similar to the last time, Evan, already far too ahead. But this time, the whole top line just did not even develop at all. This is actually going to help him a little bit to try and maintain some speed here. In fact, LeBay's going to help him a bit. Yeah, it wasn't even like that entire outside line dove down to the bottom. They just did not go, lagged back a lot. And that's why Curry is totally on his own up front. And that's how Alex LeBay gets to be the pusher of your race leader in Eckes there. And of course, you got Jesse Wuji, the 36, had to be running to good. He actually was in front of the line. He drops back down with the outside, not going anywhere. And it is about an eight car advantage to the bottom. And look who is teamed up. There's Ryan Vargas with the 55 of Rogers in behind. And now that outside line begins to gain some steam. Here comes Brandon Brown, Josh Berry, Gillen. And up the hill went Alfredo and killed that momentum of the outside line. No harm, no foul. They'll keep coming to the outside. And here comes Brandon Brown looking to make something happen. Alex LeBay hops to the outside. And he's in front of Brown. Oh, he's going to give him a huge shot, though. Brandon Brown, no mercy, is going to move Alex LeBay up to the third lane. Did not want to slow down for him, and he just about junked the 90 car. LeBay hangs on, but there he goes, dropping to the back. And oh, the spin! Brown was not clear. He's in front of the field, and it is a mess now. The big one strikes as Brown goes flipping. Massive, massive big one. But Brandon Brown was being as aggressive as he could there, Evan, to try and get himself to the front. The car he was getting pushed by, Josh Berry, he went right across the front nose of to be able to get on top of that line. He knew that was his big chance to try and move up to the front. Just couldn't get clear after the huge shot from Berry. And there's a lot of factors at play, Tim. May not be fair to say we'll just lift because he's getting pushed by Josh Barry. And if he checks up and Barry doesn't, he might get turned. But, of course, we saw the incident with LeBay first in turn number two, pushed him out of the way. And then in three, not being clear, cutting down. Uh, not a lap for the 68 team to remember. Yeah, when you look at that, we come off that restart. And I mentioned about, you know, you might take a little more than you've given the last little bit. I think there was a lot more take then give there especially for about 14 15 laps to go when this all transpired but now we're going to see some new faces near the front of the field or familiar faces returning to the front of the field you got josh berry tyler ankrum and then christian eckes in position number three and gilland rides around in position number four so this is uh this is going to change everything up a little bit we got some familiar faces up there and we got some new names that are near the front of the field that we haven't seen most of the evening 
And that's what we come to expect when we go uh, super speed by racing here at Talladega is you're going to have the comers, you're going to have the goers, and you're going to have the cars that are consistent on speed through the night. Let's take a look at the replay now and see what happened with the 68 machine of Brandon Brown. He's going to get the push. You're going to be on board in traffic here, and you'll see him move to the bottom. He was not clear of Eckes, so right here, he's going to step down, gets turned, and then everybody gonna wreck and somehow finding a hole and avoiding a lot of that mess was, I believe it was Tyler Ankrum through the middle, but you can see off of the gearbox shot there, uh, a lot of other drivers not quite as fortunate. I think I may, maybe about 15 or so cars were able to get through somewhat cleanly and still somewhat stay on the racetrack with dented and back bumpers. Just absolute calamity and that's where you're just hoping you get to the right hole at the right time the gas pedal to the floor and say please for the love of goodness sake do i make it through this wreck that's what ankrum had that's what some of the drivers like landon huffman who started at the back of the field did and now they've got the cleanest cars in the field because of it and we talk about some incidents tim landon huffman had a bit of a rough and uh, tough um, journey to this point after he started real nice at heat race one involved in an early incident finished 15th that put him way back uh, on uh, you know 29th position on the grid for this main event and uh, he's obviously not allowed that to hold him down because he's charged up front there's only two drivers running inside of the top 10 right now that actually started inside of the top 10 as we take a second look at that incident yeah, we'll take one more look at this incident here, and it starts up in front. These drivers that are two and three wide in the middle of the pack kind of have to dodge, not knowing what's going to happen in front. You see that 75 of Huffman. Keep an eye on that bright orange machine. Little dive to the inside, little slide through the grass. There goes the 90 of LeBay on the outside line. Logan Seavey slips his way through this one in the 67. A lot of those drivers, middle of the pack, had to take some evasive action to make it happen. And to be honest, with all of the drivers involved, or at least any time the lead car gets spun, uh, that was kind of shades of Tony Stewart a couple of years ago getting turned at the very, very front of the field in turn number three. Uh, and oftentimes you don't get away with that many drivers surviving. Here's one driver who did, though. Let's ride with Logan Seavey as he tries to find a hole. Yeah, and he was already in the midst of a lot of shuffling, but again, slammed the brake as hard as he could. He went for the checkup route and just barely missed LeBay. My goodness. If he didn't slam the brakes as hard as he did, he might have hit the right front on that 90 machine. Lucky to get through it. And that was really, really smart driving. A lot of the time you get a yellow flag like that or an incident in the sim. And of course, because you don't have to worry about getting hurt, a lot of the time drivers will try to uh, fly through an incident to gain positions. But the reason Logan CV now is P7 and with an opportunity to try to win this race, Tim, is because he backed it way down and uh, had to make a couple of moves like a gymnast through that. But he did survive. And you know, we saw other drivers like Drew Dollar and Bailey Curry kind of right alongside him, uh, snaking through to keep those cars in one piece. And now we have some drivers you mentioned that are in the top 10 that we might not have seen all night long. How about Joe Graff Jr.? Yeah, he's got some damage to the back end of that race car, but he's in the top 10. I don't think we said his name all night long since we went green on this 57-lap feature event. He's running in the 8th uh, place position. Donnie Lee and Justin Haley right behind him. And knocking on the door of the top 10, Ryan Truex in the 40 car, the Marquis Spas, Marquis Hot Tubs entry as he's knocking on the door of a top 10 run as well there's there's some drivers here that we haven't really spoken about all night long but are plugging away that damage might not help joe graff jr on the back end but uh he's at least up there in the top 10 and has a shot at winning this thing it's better than nothing, and this kind of takes me back to the point that i made really early on with noah gregson justin that uh, you know with the car I'd rather have rear-end damage than front-end damage, because you get front-end damage, you could have the engine overheat, you could lose the motor, and, and that could be the end of the night. But at the if the back end's damaged, especially in this kind of a race, I'm not sure how willing the car behind me is going to be to push that. Yeah, that's the thing. If you have damage at all on your race car, normally that is a red flag for drivers willing to work with you, and that's going to be the case for drivers like Joe Graff Jr., unfortunately for him now, because that back-end damage it's going to be also hard to even line up the back bumper to try and give him a shove at this point with that big-time din of the back bumper. 
Just waiting now on the opportunity to restart this race, expecting those lights on top of the base car to go out this time by. Here's the onboard shot to it with Landon Hoffman. Tim, you saw him sliding through the grass. Now let's watch it from his perspective. Three wide. You see the contact in front. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Dive to the inside. Here's that slide through the grass. And as all the cars up top bob and weave, he was able to keep it clean and is actually awarded position four because that's where he was at the moment of the caution. Yeah, nice little slide there. And you saw all those cars ahead of him on the racetrack. Probably should have been in that wreck with the way everybody was going. He had Alex LeBay to the outside. Uh, Alex got some damage from that one, obviously. So uh, he probably should have been in that wreck. But Landon Huffman, a couple of evasive moves and able to make his way through that. It has a relatively clean race car, a little bit of damage it looks like to the left rear of that car, but for the most part a clean race car and has an opportunity to win this thing well within the top five as we get ready to go green here in a couple laps. And we'll get one final look at that incident this time with Chase Caverty running just behind the number 29 to machine in front of him. Let's see, this is very similar. You see LeBay dropping back three wide. That was one of the drivers involved. There's the dive down, not clear. There's a car wrecking high and wrecking low, and somehow, with a little bit of contact, he spins, locks it down on the bottom, and as he comes back up, you can see all the cars wrecking in the rear view mirror, didn't get hit once more of that incident, drops Chase Cabry back to 19th position. Not to say he can't win this one, Justin, I would argue all 35 cars still scored on the lead lap can do so. Uh, but obviously, the closer up to the front you are, the better. With a restart, that'll only have nine laps left to go and probably will not be the final restart on the night. In other words, Evan, reach up, grab those seatbelts, get ready to buckle up because it's going to get absolutely wild once again because I wouldn't be surprised if we do see an air yellow flag with how aggressive some of the drivers can be. Don't be surprised either if we see some massive blocks like we've seen from Brandon Brown at one point to get to that top line before that attempt to take the lead to try and get them or that specific driver into a position to win this race. It'll be Josh Berry in control as he looks to become the first repeat winner of this Saturday Night Thunder Series. He holds at 65 miles an hour. You can see the running order left-hand side of your screen. We've made it through 48 laps. This race start going to be with nine laps to go. Green flag. We're back underway. And it is a good race start throughout. Josh Berry, small advantage. He needs the push from Anthony Alfredo. Yeah, keep an eye on that 33 car of Alfredo. He is going to be the wild card here as Tyler Ankrum stuck to the outside and not really a whole lot of help. Drew Dollar trying to go to the inside line in position number five. Logan Seavey poking the nose out, but so far no help for Tyler Ankrum. There goes Seavey. There goes Donnie Lee out of the outside trying to make something happen. Up in front, though, Josh Berry, Anthony Alfredo stuck to the inside line. Top 11 cars at a racetrack right now. All drivers that hold an A or a B license on iRacing. They are the experienced sim racers of the bunch. And you can see Ankra, but fourth in line, but the lead car on the outside. He is pushed by CV. Do we see an Alfredo maybe go bottom to top to take that speed away? Or is he going to stay hooked up to Josh Berry? Now this time it's eight laps to go. Well, that answer came really quickly because the rapid amount of pace on that top side, just not enough time for Alfredo to even think of that. If he tried to go for the block, you have the same situation we've seen just a couple laps ago. You have to be smart now, even with the race on the line, if you do any wrong move, it could spell trouble. It could, and you can see now the outside is going to be the ones with the speed. Not only is Ankrum clear, but CB is too as he bobbles. Oh, Ankrum nearly got turned as CB got into the bumper. It was a huge wiggle, and somehow Tyler Ankrum saved that race car. And had an opportunity from that inside line to save it as well, but now Josh Berry is on his back bumper, giving him a shot at a corner number four and trying to get him to the lead. Logan Seavey on the outside with Donnie Leah and Joe Graff Jr. on the outside as well. Christian Eckes has hopped to the outside. Fifth in line on that outside as the outside has some cars hooked up together. Two cars on the inside and a little bit of disconnection between themselves and Anthony Alfredo, but Ankrum going to poke that nose out of the two. 
And let's go on board with the 10 car. How about Justin Haley? It's been a bit of an up and down night for that leaf filter entry. But he is now back up front. What matters the most? He tried to block that time as Chris Janakis looked through. Oh, no, and there it is. Todd Gilliland's going to get turned. He's around in front of the pack. And it is big one, number two. Same spot as last time. Caution flag at 51. And this is going to make things absolutely crazy for the end of this race. But we talked about it. In this type of situation, you have to try and make crazy moves. That's what I think just happened with so many blocks going on. We had near four wide again, I think, Evan, that started it really. And we were on board with Haley, and you could see that abrupt move to the outside. The replay will show that that's because of what was happening behind him. It was the 81 machine, as I noted, of Vekas, who wanted to go three wide. He went to a third lane. Gilliland followed him, and then it was that kind of de facto three wide because... There were technically only three cars to the inside of Gilliland, but Briscoe was running the middle, so that forced Alex LeBay and Gilliland into a third lane, and it was in effect four wide at that point. The 38 got tagged. He went around. Uh, it took out Chase Briscoe, who I know is one of the drivers running the VR goggles tonight, so I'm sure that was a crazy view for him back at his home in his sim rig, and, and then we wadded up a bunch of race cars behind it. And to JP's point, when you're running in that point of the pack, you really have to start making your moves now with less than 10 laps to go. These drivers need to get themselves to the front of the field. And we'll take a look at the replay here, and you'll see that 38 of Gilliland to the outside and almost four wide to the inside. There's that bump from LeBay. And when it turned up around, you saw Briscoe get involved. There's a big hit for the 15 to machine a dollar. Truex had evolved at the bottom. I see Will Rogers, Alex LeBay, Ty Gibbs, just a whole host of drivers wrecked out in that one. And again, wrecked more virtual race cars. Justin, does it hurt like it would in the real world? Does it hurt the pocket either for the team owners? But I know that it hurts the hopes of these drivers. Everybody's super competitive wanting to win question that that probably was not going to be the final restart that rings true as we're going to have one now on the cusp of overtime i put it this way evan and i've explained this to some people before in the past where yes it's a simulation but when you really break things down these are still re real people driving these race cars with real emotions and a real passion for racing you want to win especially at Talladega because of the difficulty level. It's not easy to try and win at this racetrack. It takes a lot of talent, luck, and strategy to do it right. And guess what? The drivers who stayed to the back early on, a lot of them are now the front runners after the big one as we'll take another look from Rogers' view. And this is with Will Rogers down on the inside. He literally just made that move to the middle. And then the incident happens right in front of me. Tries to go back low to get away. There was no escape route for that 55 machine. Will Rogers, who had been primed to maybe work up front and try to win this race, uh, is unfortunately involved in that incident and will not be able uh, to fight that one out with what's left of that virtual race car. Also, housekeeping out Ty Gibbs parked by race control uh, for an incident with the Drew Dollar under the caution flag. So the 18 machine has been given uh, the black flag. His night is done, Tim, and different circumstances this time around but i think you got will on the radio again yeah well, there's a uh, see through all of that uh, that happened there yeah honestly not really sure uh what happened there just kind of got collected in everybody uh, when they came down the racetrack i tried to go low to try to dodge it but unfortunately got stuck behind somebody and uh you know it is what it is one of these uh one of these uh pack incidents i guess on super speedway so we're here fixing the damage, hopefully going to go back out there and, and salvage a race. So now trying to get back, what, what can you salvage with, with only probably three laps to go when we go green? Uh, you know, I, I think maybe if there's another wreck, if we go green, white, checkered again, we might be able to actually gain a few more positions looking at the ticker here with P32. So uh, I think that's honestly our only shot. Maybe if somebody, you know, gets stacked up on the bottom lane or, or one of the lanes, we can we can move up. But at this point, we're kind of just uh, trying to bring her home, load her on the truck, and get out of town. We'll get what you can out of the space station number 55. We wish you all the best in these couple laps. Good luck. Thanks, guys.
There you go, Evan. There's Will Rogers, and he's going to have a great view of the action that happens in front of him. Uh, we could potentially have, as you mentioned, a couple of green-white checker finishes, so uh, he's hoping to get what he can here and, as he mentioned, get out of town and uh, move on to the next event, but uh, I, I don't think this is over, and we may or may not have seen our last caution flag. We'll have to see how this plays out. The timing on this is going to be very interesting because we mentioned up to three attempts at a green to white checkered and the rules are the same as in NASCAR Cup Series competition. Xfinity truck and, and all that uh, for what it's worth is uh, you need to get to the white flag for an attempt to be considered official. If they do not do so, we try it again. But if the lights go out on top of the paint truck this next time by Justin, that would set us up for a two lap to go restart in regulation effectively uh one of maybe four attempts at agreed to my checkered if there was anything to happen in terms of trouble off the restart because it takes about a full half a lap to three quarters of a lap to get up to speed it'd be the run to turn three because as we've seen so many drivers are trying to dart their way to the bottom line if someone tries to cut across from the middle line to the bottom it might be right about here where anything was to happen, if not on the corner exit, once drivers try and bump draft one another to try and gain speed on that straightaway in the middle to top line again. Lots can happen, and lots is about to develop, I think. It's going to be interesting. What we talk about tonight uh, being a precursor to the Pro Invitational tomorrow, and one of the drivers going to be involved in that one is the driver of the 18 Toyota, Kyle Busch. Kyle, you got us on radio? I got you, boys. What's going on? Well, these guys are making a mess of some virtual race cars right now, but I know that that's not what you want to do tomorrow afternoon. What has the prep been like for your virtual Super Speedway debut? Uh, it hadn't been too bad. We've had a couple practice races here and uh, this week, and I think this is about race number three or four, actually. So the replacements race the other night on Tuesday night was really awesome. We had a great time there running the Rowdy Energy Camry, and um, hopefully we got a good run tomorrow practice in a little bit more here and get ready tonight's format obviously a bit different than what we'll see tomorrow you guys have a bit of a longer race but we've seen some drivers hang back try to save that reset what's the game plan going to be for the 18 team oh just here we go look at that they're wrecking get by ah um yeah just race like hell and when you're out of resets you quit you know just <laughs> that's all you can do you try to practice up front so you can race up front and uh, get as much skill leading and what you got to do with the temperatures and stuff like that in order to be ready in case that uh, that happens. That's what you that's where you want to be at the end of the race on Sunday. And for reference, we're pacing. So the reckon that Kyle's talking about is in the practice race seasons, Kyle. So sounds like you guys are having just as chaotic as uh, an event as we are. So I will let you jump off, but we appreciate the time. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have fun. And uh, the side racing thing ain't too bad. It's pretty fun, boys having fun with it again you can catch that show tomorrow afternoon it is at one o'clock p.m eastern time fox fs1 and the fox sports app but meanwhile here where we are not currently wrecking we did get the lights off on top of the i racing official pace truck so here we go tim it'll be a two lap to go restart not an overtime but the objective for the cars up front remains the same get to the white flag make this official and let's race it out from there Restart going to be really key here. Tyler Ankrum going to control this restart. How big of a restart and how big of a jump do you get on Josh Berry and Logan Seavey? Two names that know how to win on Saturday Night Thunder. Then you get a guy in position number four like Donnie Leah mentioned. Potentially a dark horse pick here to, to rise to the top at the end. He's currently sitting in fourth. Anthony Alfredo, we know how strong he is on the iRacing service sitting in position number five. And then you got some... Drivers uh, hanging out on the back end of the top 10. Should something happen to these drivers up in front? They're going to be in the catbird seat as we get ready to go racing for two laps. Pace truck is in. It'll be a two-lap to go restart, still inside of schedule distance. Tyler Ankrum and Josh Berry going to be side-by-side -side on the front row, but they are basically in the hands of the drafted help from behind. CV pushing on the bottom. It'll be Donnie Lee, a second in line to pushing that Indiana Berry on the outside line. Here we go, though. Two laps to go from Talladega, and there's already contact on the outside. Green flag flies. Here we go. And I think a couple drivers trying to jump the start already. Three wide and a one. 
It's Briscoe to the outside. A big block by Donnie Leah, though. He is going to abandon Josh Berry now in the middle line. That gives a big advantage to Tyler Ankrum down low. Three wide, now four, five wide, and a spin. Ankrum's going to get turned. He's in front of the pack, and it's the biggest one. Caution flag. That's half your field. About seven made it through, and they're still wrecking out back. Christian Eckes in the middle of it. Cabri's down to the inside. You've got a lot of names that were up in front, including Tyler Ankrum, who was looking like he was going to win this thing, or at least finish in the top three. That has been dashed, and we'll see our first official green-white checker finish coming up. It honestly, Justin, I was concerned about the 4-5 the wide behind, but uh, and that's what caught me off guard there with Tyler Ankrum getting turned. But, I mean, it was just a little bit of a touch from Logan Seavey behind in the right rear quarter panel, a little bit of a movement right to left on that bumper, and it hooked him around. And if you thought those other wrecks were big ones, uh, check this one out when we get a second look. Yeah, we were talking to Kevin Iren early about uh, tonight's race a little bit, one of the iRacing officials, and he mentioned specifically the pointy nose that are on these Xfinity cars, and that could come into play if someone tries to give a shove. That's exactly what came into play with Logan CV trying to give the shove to Ankrum. Just didn't get it lined up square, hit it on the right side of the bumper. In turn, we have our biggest wreck of the race as a result. So we do now extend into overtime, and you can see uh, as some of the cars limp around, others more fortunate. Anthony Alfredo back up to second. He had been one of the best drivers tonight and had kind of dropped back recently. He's going to be scored P2, and this is one of those times, uh, Tim, where the automated timing and scoring in a virtual setting is real nice because that would be a mess to pick out where everybody was running at the moment of caution. Expect a lot of damaged race cars, though, to be forced to pit because of that. Yeah, you got about six or seven cars that made it by, at least the top four, top five made it by without any damage. And you look at the cream rising to the top, you got Logan Seavey, Josh Berry in your picture there. They have won uh, the Saturday Night Thunder races. you got Anthony Alfredo up there. you still got some familiar faces going to battle for it, but you've also got some faces that got swept up in that one that uh, uh, aren't going to have an opportunity to win this thing. Let's take a look at your iRacing replay for the bigger one down the back straightaway. And again, there's chaos behind, but just watch the 67. He's just pushing Ankrum, trying to help him out. And there's a little bit of a move right there, just not lined up. And when it turned Ankrum in front of the pack, they were four wide behind. And at one point, the entire track blocked on the back straightaway. And that is a huge, huge mess. Yeah, I don't think either any of us were expecting that to be the result of turn number two. But again, if you don't line up your bumper square, that's the risk that happens, especially with the point to nose, and especially with a little bit of the bumper on the Ford nose. And that's what was the case there that caused the massive one. We'll get another uh, perspective on this one. You're not missing anything on track as we pace it to get things ordered out. Uh, and this will be the look from high above at the IRAC to blimp. And you see cars pushing behind, but it's just the slightest bit of contact right there that caught him out of sorts. And when he is in front of the traffic there, uh, again, half of those cars had absolutely no hope of getting involved. And they wrecked basically, Tim, for the middle portion of that super stretch all the way down to turn three couple of hard hits there. You saw Kyle Weatherman go to the inside wall, but I feel bad for Donnie Leah. Donnie was running on the outside line, kind of minding his own P's and Q's. He moved up to that outside line to try to make it work, and uh, when Ankrum got spun, there was nowhere to go for Donnie Leah. He was along for the ride at that point, and uh, that's essentially, I believe, going to end his evening, uh, along with a few other drivers that took hard hits in that one, but we're going to have a green-white checker. Logan Seavey once again up in front, and He's won one of these Saturday Night Thunder shows. He's looking for another one, and he's in good position right now. A lot of these drivers reset, kind of shake it off, and, and get set to do it again. And, you know, well, yes, at the end of the day, this is all in a virtual world, Justin. I promise you, even when I race in meaningless races that nobody watches, I'm sweating when I'm driving in the car. I mean, it is intense, especially here at Talladega, when you have to be so tense on the wheel, when you're two, three wide to make sure you don't push up or slide down on anybody. And these drivers probably getting that heart rate up uh, over the course of this one. Let's take a look with Tommy Joe Martins now. 
Yeah, and you can see there's not a lot of things, like space you can see first off to try and find a way. He's one of the drivers who is already amongst the cars trying to take advantage of that three a lot wide. And then he sensed something was happening. He was already on the brakes before they even got made contact of it. Yeah, he saw the four wide and again, the incident's even further up the road. Look out, look out, goes low. And the C's part just set up. So Martin's gonna move up into 13th position. And with a clean race car, again, with a fighting shot at taking the win here from Talladega. But again, I'm still amazed, Tim, that it was that four wide that Tommy Joe had a great view of that that's not what caused it. And I was kind of thinking to myself, well, on a green white checker with only two laps, I mean, how much time are you going to have to actually get up to speed and to get some lines for them? Well, they were already four wide off a of turn two, so I guess that's not a concern. We saw a couple of restarts here, Evan, at the end. We saw Brandon Brown a little bit earlier. We saw Chase Briscoe push to the front on the outside. As you, We're going to take one more look at this one, I do believe, and you'll ride on board with Brett Moffitt, and he's right in the middle of the pack. That's Jesse Uji in front of him, and they're two and three wide. This is that outside line that started to form and was working its way towards the front. Then they get about four wide right here. Briscoe ahead, and there's nowhere to go right here if you're... Uh, Brett Moffat, you're along for the ride. And, uh, not as worse for wear as some of those other drivers, Evan. He's got a little bit of damage, but be able to continue, unlike some of those drivers that got that inside wall. Yeah, we mentioned Brett uh, recovering uh, from his injury and, and certainly wish him the best and hope uh, that that goes as smoothly as possible. And maybe uh, that an incident earlier in the race uh, may have taken him out of this. And yes, he does have damage, but I mean, he's in P10, Justin. And, you know, we, we could get to the white flag and have chaos then. And at that point, who knows where you have to be running in the field to be the lucky person to survive. I mean, there's so many different variables at Talladega that it's it's totally impossible to kind of predict how this thing is going to finish. Absolutely. And there have been some cases, Evan, where I've called races in the past. And I've mentioned this a couple of times throughout the week where people who are all the way back in 14th position, not even in the lead pack, end up coming away with the checker flag. There's a chance we see that again tonight with the way things shape out. All it takes is one bad bump, one bad decision in the pack to shake up everything when the green flag flies once again on this first green white checker. And the lights are out, so we are ready to go. Who do you think at home is going to win this Saturday Night Thunder one? Let us know. You could use the hashtag EDASCAR and the hashtag Saturday Night Thunder. Let's go row by row at the front. Logan Seavey going to be alongside with Anthony Alfredo on roll, or row number one. They're going to be first and second, and their role in this is going to be to get pushed. I mean, they just have to get a good restart, but the real work comes in on row two. Landon Huffman third, Josh Berry fourth. They will be the pushers in all of this chaos. Behind them, Justin Haley from 22nd on the grid to P5. He'll be alongside Joe Graff Jr. in a pretty beat up number 80 car in P6. Row four, we'll see Bailey Curry and Jesse Awuji, and then Jeb Burton and Brett Moffitt rounding out your top 10. From there on the back, I don't know how this is going to go, Tim. I don't know if this is going to be the final restart on the night, but I can promise no matter what happens, it'll be entertaining. Yeah, if you're outside the top 10, you're going to try to keep the throttle pinned, aim for the smoke if it shows up in front of you and try to get yourself uh, through it and potentially to a may, maybe top 10, top 5 run. If there's a caution flag, you do a little bit more, but you said it. Row number 2 is going to be key. That All Things Automotive 88 to Josh Berry, the 75 to the inside of Landon Huffman. I think that's going to be the key role. That's going to control what happens here. Obviously, Logan CB is your leader, but you get out in front, you take that white flag, you're kind of a sitting duck to the point where you, you might not know what's going to happen. We just saw it with Tyler Ankrum. This is going to be an interesting finish. Yeah, you may almost not want to be that control car. Uh, you know, Anthony Alfredo, depending on how this goes, may actually be in a better position because, uh, I mean, the 75 of Huffman could push CV for all his life, but uh, if the outside gets hooked up, it's going to be very difficult to slow them down unless we see CV try to play both lanes and go high and low to protect from that outside and getting around him. Base truck down it in as we enter EDAS car overtime. Attempt number one at a green-white checkered finish. 
It is Logan CV looking for a second win in Saturday Night Thunder. They'll roll through the trioval. All eyes on the flag stand. Green flag in the air. Two laps to go. Much better start compared to last time. And already everybody ditching the bottom side, trying to get a run on the top. Look at the 88 and the 33. They're hooked up. It's Alfredo pushed by Barry. The field separates a good bit here. So the car's up front with a real shot at racing this one out. Huffman, though, can't get to the bumper of CV. It's Anthony Alfredo with the speed high side to turn three. If you're Justin Haley, where do you go? You're that fifth car in line. You're the control car there, that outside line. Getting that push and a little more push. Anthony Alfredo, a little sideways off the bumper of Barry. They're going to bring the 11 of Justin Haley along. Three to the upside, two to the downside. Logan Seavey, Landon Huffman going to try to make it work to the inside line. They'll come through the trioval, and I think we're going to get to see that white flag, Evan. We're going to have one more to go right here. So far, so good behind. It is Alfredo Claire. Oh, he's going to get turned at the line. They take the white flag. So this race is official. Alfredo is junked. And it's Logan Seavey now in front. He's pushed by Huffman. And the question is going to be, is there enough time for Barry and Haley to try and regroup? And can Huffman try and poke his nose out to try and get a run by Seavey? Remember, this is such a big time moment here. Three wide right behind him. Big speed with Josh Berry from third, but Huffman doesn't want to stay with the 67. He gets his wrong. Haley goes high. It is low for Josh Berry. Here we come with some tandems. Final time at turn four. They're trying to go three wide behind. It's Logan CV, but he doesn't have the drafting help. Here comes the 75, and as they wreck behind him, it is Landon Huffman, a Saturday Night Thunder winner from Talladega. That second row on that final restart was key, and they come home with one and two, and it's Landon Huffman taking away the checkered flag, Josh Berry in second. And man, Tommy Joe Martins had one hell of a run at the end of that one. Couldn't get up and finish the job, but he's going to get a top five run out of nowhere. We thought it was going to be Alfredo. Just as they took to the white, he got turned. The yellow could not have possibly been thrown in time, so the race was official. And then it was Huffman, who I thought Johnson on the back straight away, he was done. He went to the outside, left CV, and initially Josh Berry held the bottom, didn't go with him. But it was the push from the 11 of Justin Haley that did the job. The interval is 0.14 seconds as Landon Huffman captures the Saturday Night Thunder on fifth. You can see Barry, and how about Joe Graff Jr. flying it in for a P3 result in this one? The rest of them were basically wrecking across the line with Tommy Joe Martin's fourth and Spencer Boyd in fifth. Brett Moffitt, Austin Sindrick, Scott Stenzel, CJ McLaughlin, and Tyler Ankrum through P10. 11th spot tonight goes to Ryan Truex. Started back in 30th. Jeb Burton in 12th position. Brandon Brown, we've seen that aggressive move from at one point. Still came home in 13th after being involved in one of the big ones tonight. Will Rogers in 14th, Chris Neck is 15th, Ryan Vargas 16th, but Todd Gillen, Ryan Ellis, Jesse Awuji, and Justin Haley, who gave that huge shove to Landon Huffman, coming home P20. You look at the next page, you got Drew Herring, Logan Seavey was up front, going to come home in 22nd position. Matt Mills, Derek Krause, Josh Balicki, Maya so Snyder, and Anthony Alfredo. Oh, what might have been in 27th. Bailey Curry in 28th. Last driver scored in the lead lap. Josh Williams, one lap down. And Justin Allgaier hung on for a top 30 finish. And then to continue on through the rest of these drivers, not making it the entire distance, the likes of Stephen Light and Drew Dollar, who were in it late, uh, but as well the drivers who wrecked out with Donnie Leah, Chase Briscoe, Chase Cabry through P35, Harrison Burton, Kyle Weatherman, Ty Gibbs, Alex LeBay, Noah Gregson, those bottom names, some of the best from early on tonight through position number 40. So celebrating going on on the front straight away. Let's talk with our third place finisher, Joe Graff Jr. Justin, let's see if you've got him. Yes, indeed. Joe Graff Jr. Do you have a copy, copy, sir? Yes, sir. I've got you. First things first, crazy finish to this race. Let's talk about what you've seen as you came to the white flag and then trouble started to ensue. Yeah. Um, well, we had a little bit of damage from the caution before uh, on that 
restart. We got a little bit of front end rear damage, um, but just a cra crazy ending to that race. I, I can't thank uh, everybody who's, who's helped me enough. Um, obviously, my team, SS Greenlight, um, my buddy Bobby Rafferty, Jim Beaver Esports, and 07 Designs for designing the car, and obviously Core Development and Eat Sleep Race is my sponsors. Um, definitely a really good race for us. We played it safe to start, tried to uh, keep out of trouble. We actually didn't use our faster pair, so I was pretty happy about that. Um, good to thank your car. Yeah, thank you, Wes, too. Uh, Wes, the engineer from the team, actually spotted the race for us, too. Yeah, I could hear him in the backdrop giving a bit of the encouragement, uh, but... You mentioned the strategy of trying to keep the car clean throughout the race. Kind of, how was it trying to keep your focus to try and keep focused on that strategy throughout the night? Well, you, you just have to know it's a long race. Like, you can't give up too much. Um, like, you don't want to lose that lead pack because then you, if it, there is a green flag run, you go in danger of losing a lap, and then that puts you in a really big hole that you can't usually get out of. So, you have to be conservatively aggressive, is what I call it, just to get through the race because it doesn't help if you have to lose your quick reset on a uh, lap 10. Absolutely. But now where does the focus go for you and your team now that you came away with one of your best finishes in Saturday Thunder so far? Um, well, we're just going to work hard to uh, be good at Dover next week and be ready for the next race. Um, can't wait to get back racing in real life, but this has been a, uh, been a lot of fun to pass the time. Anyone you want to thank once again before we let you go tonight? Yeah, just uh, my sponsors, Core Development, Eat Sleep Race, my team, SS Greenlight, and everybody who's uh, helped me with the esports side of it. Jim Beaver Esports, Bobby Rafferty, and 07 Designs. Huge shout out to them. Thank you very much for the time. Congratulations on the top three finish tonight, Joe. Thank you. That was George Raff Jr. coming home in third tonight, Evan. And let's talk with your race winner, because Landon Huffman knows a thing or two about this whole sim racing deal, and he's the winner of tonight's Saturday Night Thunder 150. Landon, congratulations on the win. Obviously, the qualifying spot was it a concern from P29. Talk us through this one. To be honest, man, I probably shouldn't have won that one there at the end. We were just in the right place at the right time and avoided a bunch of the wrecks, but... Dude, I was telling the guys in the Discord server, <laughs> it feels like this race win almost means more than a lot of my real life wins because, um, you know, opportunities in the real world have been tough to come by. So to be able to race against all these guys and, and you know, an event like this that our racing puts on is pretty special and it's a good time and we all get to stream it to our fans. So uh, to be there at the end and have a shot at it was uh, was pretty badass. It was pretty cool. We've been seeing a lot of these guys kind of learning uh, the sim these last few weeks with Saturday Night Thunder, and uh, we, you know, we didn't really know what we were going to see coming into Talladega, how this would actually uh, match up to expectations. I feel like, you know, for the most part, it was pretty solid. I feel like, uh, you know, people rode for a good portion there towards the middle of the race, and, um, you know, the up front, they were still side-by-side -side racing, so I feel like uh, everyone watching got a good show, and um, you know, once everybody gets accustomed to the sim and starts getting used to how the virtual cars race, I knew the racing would get better. Um, I think each week we do this, it's going to get better. So I think it's just a testament to I racing and what they're able to put together for us. We ask this each week in this Saturday Night Thunder series, of course, with drivers from so many different disciplines that a lot of the people tuning in may be introduced to, to new names for the first time. And uh, if that's true for somebody at home who has not yet heard the name Landon Huffman, how can they keep up with you? And uh, when we get back to real life race at work, could they find you behind the wheel? Um, I usually race local short tracks. I grew up here in North Carolina and I've raced Hickory Motor Speedway my whole life. I grew up you know, race and late model stocks. And that's still what I do for the most part. I get to run a few truck races here and there when sponsorships uh, present themselves. But um, now I actually started my own esports business about eight months ago and I work full time for it now. Um, last year I was spotting across the NASCAR circuit. So it's been a little bit of a career change, but I'm still trying to race when I can. And uh, when my weekends are free, I try to do that. But um, I just like to thank everybody that helps my esports organization, Total Advantage. Uh, Belly Up Sports has come on board the race car these past two weeks for this invitational deal. Uh, Sim Seats is one of my longtime iRacing sponsors, and they've come on board and uh, kind of rejoined me as I get back into the iRacing service. And uh, Titan Bill Construction, Double XP Labs, and a lot of people that are a part of what we do are just uh, excited that we get to do this and have a good time doing it during this all this uh, COVID mess. 
Well, we're happy to have you with us on the weekends, Landon. We appreciate the time as well here post-race. Congratulations on the win. Uh, we'll go see if you can do that again uh, next weekend. Thanks, guys. The race winner tonight uh, from Talladega. And speaking of familiar names, how about a P2 finish tonight for Josh Berry? Tim, you've caught up with him. Very eventful last couple of laps, Josh. Walk us through what happened there on that green-white checker. What did you see out of the windshield? Yeah, I felt like I was in a pretty good spot there being on the outside row. And I was able to to push Anthony the lead. And, um, you know, he kind of kept trying to play back and forth between the two lanes. And uh, coming out of the trial over there, he went to the bottom, which was kind of what I was expecting him to, to try to go to the bottom. And then he kind of eased his way back up. And uh, I got into his right rear and hooked him. I hate that that happened, but um, that's just a product of this kind of racing. But. Overall, it was a good run for us. Um, it got the pole wrecked on the first lap of the heat race and uh, got stuck in the back and kind of had to just fight our way forward. I was about to say, we, we had this conversation with the Grand National Tour on Wednesday night. You had to pick your way through traffic, pass a lot of drivers. How did you keep your composure through the early part of this race, knowing that a lot of this was going to unfold? Yeah, I kind of expected it to be wild. I just, a lot of, a lot of these drivers are very good but just don't have a lot of experience in this style of racing and um i kind of found myself in like middle of the pack early on and actually uh ended up getting swept up in a wreck just wasn't able to to avoid it and had to use my repair and then after that just kind of just tried to set myself up for the end and was lucky to make it back to the front and miss several wrecks there um that was really close to getting caught up in them so um all in all it was fun it was, like i said it was a good it was a good time it's a good race it's just uh it's just tough to stay out of trouble in these races. And it's another virtual podium finish. Congratulations tonight on the second place run. Yep, thank you. That's the iRacing All Things Automotive number 88 driver Josh Berry. Evan coming home with a, another podium finish. He's been racking up a lot of this virtual hardware here the last couple of weeks on iRacing. He's been doing a real good job, but if we talk about some of that experience, obviously Landon Huffman, somebody who's been around the sim for a while, as we take one more look at that final lap. Big thanks to Landon, Josh, and Joe for chatting with us post-race, and Justin, as we relive this one one more time, what were your thoughts on tonight's race? I thought about right about here. It was, you heard me say it, this is a big, big moment, because if he did what he did here, he'll put him in the right position. It was a bold move to try and cut up here, getting some help to set things up. But overall, for the entire race as a whole, Evan, we've seen just about all of it tonight. A lot of trouble in some cases, a lot of strategy coming into play. But in the end, the drivers who balanced the right amount of luck, aggression as well as strategy, ended up coming away with the checkered flag. And guess what? It was Huffman who had the best strategy and the right amount of aggressiveness at the right time. The top three drivers who finished first, second, and third started 29th, 37th, and 32nd, respectively. Tim, it's always so fun to come out here and have fun on a Saturday night. I think my favorite part of it is the drivers for being involved in it and making themselves as well available to us as well to chat with. The big thanks to all of the drivers who hopped on a radio and Kyle Busch as well for showing up. But again, it's all intense in, in, in anticipation of the big show tomorrow afternoon, 1 o'clock on Fox it is uh, another round of the EDAS Car IRAC to Pro Invitational Series. And not only do we open the field back up to 40 NASCAR Cup drivers, but uh, some new names continue to show their face on the sim, including somebody named Jeff Gordon, if you've ever heard of him. Really looking forward to that show tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be exciting. If it's anything like tonight, it's going to be action-packed, a little bit of pressure, and uh, we're going to see some some things that we uh, we haven't seen before with uh, w what's been going on with the pro uh, or the pro invitational series. I, I can't wait to see how it translates. Uh, congratulations to Landon Huffman, Josh Berry, Joe Graff. At the end of the race, the fireworks went off. We'll have to see what transpires tomorrow on Fox as the big boys get ready to play at Talladega. And if you look forward to that, until then, though, that's it for us as Saturday Night Thunder from Talladega falls into our rear view mirror. On behalf of the entire team at NASCAR iRacing and your broadcast team tonight, for Justin Prince, Tim Terry, and myself, Evan Pasoko, I want to thank you for tuning in. It has been a thrilling couple of weeks on the iRacing service and Saturday Night Thunder specifically. 
continues to deliver, giving the drivers of the Xfinity Series, the Truck Series, and more an opportunity to get onto the sim and in front of a big audience and to showcase their talent. But of course, the main event is tomorrow afternoon, Sunday, April the 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for the GEICO 70 Round 5 of the EDAS Car Pro Invitational iRacing Series. You can catch that one on Fox FS1 in the Fox Sports app. Just double check your local listings to make sure that you can get in on all of the fun and you will see some of NASCAR stars take to it. Until then, though, we'll see you next time here on the iRacing Esports Network.